I've just realised that the... You can't see this. I'm looking at my camera. There's a yellow line that's slightly off center. It means that the camera angle is slightly tilted. It's been like this for, for probably all of my videos because my tripod is terrible. And I've just realized that that's what that meant. Anyway, hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I can't, I'm having a mare at the moment. I'm having a right nightmare at the moment. I kind of can't hear properly because I went swimming, yada, yada, yada. So it just sounds like I'm talking underwater at the moment. So if I'm yelling or quieter than usual, that's why. But for today's video, well, actually, if it, it feels like I'm not uploading my channel for weeks at a time, that's not the new structure. That's not what I'm trying to do yet. I'm trying to be more organized, but I did spend a week in Edinburgh this month for the Fringe Festival. That was well good in it. That's all I've been up to really. But for this video, I went through, the sound of my voice is really annoying me right now. I went through Divergent, that's the one. I've only spent weeks scripting it, but forgot the bloody name of the book. I went through Divergent painstakingly to prove to you lot, I don't really need to. It's pretty obvious that it was a cheap derivative cash grab. My hair's not greasy. I washed it and I can't be bothered to dry it because it's warm right now. It's a known thing that Divergent was a cash grab on the coattails of the Hunger Games phenomena. There were plenty more copycat dystopian young adult books, but I thought I'd go through this one first of all, because it's probably one of the most recognizable ones and also one of the most forgettable ones. They didn't even bother doing the final movie. They did that thing where there's three books and they tried to make the last book into two movies. And then I don't think they ever bothered finishing it. So that's fun. I've never watched the films, but I did read the books last year. So I decided to read them again to do one of these long form book review videos that we all love so much. But first, today's video is sponsored by Jackpot World. Do you want to feel like you're in Las Vegas, but you don't want to spend the money or get on the plane and go over there because it's a long flight, then look no further. Jackpot World is a completely free to play mobile game available on Android and iOS. You can play it anywhere and anytime. Here we are in the lobby right now. Look at this gorgeous design. This is one that I like playing, Penguin Quest, because I love penguins. How you play it is you just keep spinning until the numbers get bigger. This is a free to play mobile game. Absolutely no real money is involved. It is not real gambling. New downloaders of the game will get 12 million free coins when they log in. Look at this, look at that. See, leveled up already, I just keep winning. Look at that, I just collected a bunch of free coins for no reason. Even more free coins. There are more than a hundred slot games with different themes. There are various themes of mythology, Eastern and Western stories. And this one, which has a bunch of cows and UFOs in it, because why not? This is also the fastest updated slots game with new slots released every single week. It has beautiful in-game design. Look at all these fish, how beautiful they all are. There is also an extremely high payout. You can hit a jackpot in 10 minutes. There are also various free coins and you can receive free coins every 15 minutes. And there is a whole range of various side games and mini games. If you click the link in my description box to download the game and use the gift code Elise, you will receive $100 worth of coins. You will love this game if you're also interested in stamp collecting, pet raising, cooking games, bingo games, and more. Look at that, super win. God, I'm so good at this. Make sure you check out the daily missions. Unlock the missions for a special treat. Check out the dreamy voyage where you can loot treasure, build islands, attack islands, and more. Complete with a spinning game. You can also collect stamps. Apart from getting stamps from spins, players can also get them from almost all gameplays. So keep an eye out for those during gameplay. You can trade or gift stamps amongst your friends and a wide variety of stamps will be updated constantly. 
There's also even more features than that. For example, you can join the union or create your own union with your friends. Besides chatting, you can also get more prizes with your members' help. Hmm. I'm gonna join... that one. Oh. Maybe not. There we go. Joined. And there is a limited side game that changes every week. This week is Fishing Master. In this section, there are also more nostalgic games for you to play, like Bingo, Snakes and Ladders, Fortune Run. You can win coins, prizes, free games and much more in each side game. Personally, I just think that these games are fun ways to spend my spare time. They really tickle the dopamine receptors. For whatever reason that may be. I just really like seeing the numbers go up and get bigger and bigger. If only it did translate to real life, I might be able to finally get a mortgage of my own. Here I am playing the game with my own hands. So what are you waiting for? Hurry up and hit the link in my description box to get your free $100 worth of coins. Make sure you use code Elise. Thank you so much Jackpot World for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on with it. Chapter 1. There is a mirror in my house. It is behind a sliding panel in the hallway upstairs. Our faction allows me to stand in front of it on the second day of every third month, the day my mother cuts my hair. I sit on the stool and my mother stands behind me with the scissors trimming. The strands fall on the floor in a dull blonde ring. When she finishes, she pulls my hair away from my face and twists it into a knot. I note how calm she looks and how focused she is. She is well practiced in the art of losing herself. I can't say the same of myself. I sneak a look at my reflection when she isn't paying attention, not for the sake of vanity, hm, of course not, but out of curiosity. A lot can happen to a person's face in three long months. Nope, just three months, just nothing long about them. In my reflection, I see a narrow face, wide round eyes and long, a long thin nose. I still look like a little girl, hmm. But though sometime in the last few months I turned 16. The other factions celebrate birthdays, but we don't. It would be self-indulgent. This is the first page. It is boring. Oh. I am falling asleep whilst typing this and whilst reciting this. I have entered REM sleep and dreamed of myself writing a better first page than this. Maybe it's meant to be boring on purpose because the Hogwarts house that Triss, Beatrice, the main character, is in is the boring one. Hello. Triss. It's me, Hagrid. But maybe that is just too gracious of me. I think a lot of books tend to write like this now, very matter-of-factly. It's not very interesting for my poor ADHD-ridden attention span. Also, the idea that she hasn't seen her face in months isn't one I believe. There are naturally reflective surfaces everywhere throughout nature. Is there no bathroom mirrors at the school? No reflective windows? No puddles? Can no one look at themselves properly in this society? Sounds truly dystopian to me. I stare into my own eyes for a moment. Today is the day of the aptitude test that will show me which of the five factions I belong in. And tomorrow, at the choosing ceremony, I will decide on a faction. I will decide the rest of my life. I will decide to stay with my family or abandon them. I love how the Hunger Games, for their plot, had you can choose to play in these games in place of a loved one, but you will probably most likely die. Whereas this has choose your own Hogwarts house style adventure. I will at times, quite unfairly, cause I'm not a nice person, associate this story with The Hunger Games and other young adult books because I'm convinced that this was written just to piggyback upon the dystopian young adult success. You know that because I said that in the intro already. Mm. Also, it's not strictly prohibited for the factions to interact. People probably could still see their own families, but they just let pride and ego get in the way of it. It's a very self-inflicted problem. Isn't everything. People do not really want or desire happiness. And I think it's good that it is like that. She kisses my cheek and slides the panel over the mirror. I think my mother could be beautiful in a different world. Ooh, foreshadowing. Her body is thin beneath the grey robe. How dare you? 
more unrealistic beauty standards in books for women. She has high cheekbones and long eyelashes, and when she lets her hair down at night, it hangs in waves over her shoulders, but she must hide that beauty in abnegation. In this book, everyone has to choose an SAT word, a single personality trait to stick to and make their whole lives revolve around it. Some people it's easier than others. It's as thrilling as it sounds. Thank goodness the SAT words aren't constipation, unpunctual, blight, necrophile, and James Corden. Time to lift off the kilt, see what we're working with down there. <laughs> see if I'm a, a traditional Scotsman or not. Triss wants to leave her boring family. She has one older brother. Her faction, Abnegation, is all about selflessness. Not to be that person, but what's so selfless about having two children, huh? That's like doing your recycling, doing your bit for the environment, but punching dolphins in the face on the weekends. And mm, they probably do deserve it. They are notoriously arseholes. Five years ago, volunteer construction workers from Abnegation repaved some of the roads. They started in the middle of the city and worked their way outward until they ran out of materials. The roads where I live are still cracked and patchy and it's not safe to drive on them. We don't have a car anyway. Why would they run out of raw materials? They live in Chicago, which is a pretty big city. I don't know. Why don't they have a car? Is it because having a car is deemed too self-indulgent? Wait till I tell you about having kids then. There is a faction called Candor who only tell the truth. They sound like a bunch of high school prefects who dob you in for putting gum underneath the tables. They sound like every edgy YouTuber ever. I'm just bluntly honest. I'm just bluntly honest. That's why I'm calling you fat and ugly to your face because I'm just honest. I am the most trustworthy, honest YouTuber. No, you're just a twat. Anation, shut up. The bus stops in front of the school and I get up, scooting past the candle man. I grab Caleb's arm as I stumble over the man's shoes. My slacks are too long and I've never been that graceful. Oh my God, better swan, is that you? <laughs> I could tell him I've been worried for weeks about what the aptitude test will tell me. Abnegation, candor, erudite, amity, or dauntless. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Can't hear myself. Oh, I can, but it feels it sounds like I'm under the sea. A girl with long curly hair shouts "Hey!" next to my ear, waving at a distant friend. A jacket sleeve smacks me on the cheek. Then an erudite boy in a blue sweater shoves me. I lose my balance and fall hard on the ground. Out of my way, stiff! He snaps and continues down the hallway. This is the new mudblood for the Gen Z. No, when this come out. Is this millennial? No, I don't know. For the TikTok generation. My cheeks warm. I get up and dust myself off. A few people stopped when I fell, but none of them offered to help me. Their eyes follow me to the edge of the hallway. This sort of thing has been happening to others in my faction for months now. The erudite have been releasing antagonistic reports about abnegation, and it has begun to affect the way we relate at school. That sounds proper like a robot. It has begun to affect the way we relate to the other homo sapiens at the Edumacation Center. The grey clothes, the plain hairstyle, and the unassuming demeanor of my faction are supposed to make it easier for me to forget myself and easier for everyone else to forget me too. But now they make me a target. Yeah, this is why factions based upon a single defining trait are stupid. Stand up for yourself. This is also why it won't really work in the first place, so it is a bit hard to suspend your disbelief. A faction based on selflessness and pacifism would get steamrolled by another faction. I know that's basically what happens by the end of the book, but I think it would happen a lot sooner than a few hundred years. I pause by a window in the E-wing and wait for the Dauntless to arrive. I do this every morning. At exactly 7.25, the Dauntless prove their bravery by jumping from a moving train. My father calls the Dauntless Hellions. They are pierced, tattooed, and black clothed. Their primary purpose is to guard the fence that surrounds our city. From what? I don't know. Why doesn't anyone know? Dauntless faction is clearly more interesting than all the other factions. So much so there's not really a competition in what faction you would choose to go in because the rest of the factions are all stern nerds. At least in Harry Potter, Ravenclaw, Gryffindor, and Hufflepuff all seem equally all right pros and cons. JK Rowling, I don't think she should have made Slytherin a purely bully house though. There should have been at least a few all right Slytherins so it wasn't so black and white. Oh yeah, that house is just for the blood purist fascists. It's more compelling when things have nuance. I think she did originally plan for there to be someone in Slytherin who was all right, but I don't know. Anyway, Triss goes to class, chapter two. 
Susan's father travels throughout the city for his job, so he has a car and drives her to and from school every day. He offered to drive us too, but as Caleb says, we prefer to leave later and would not want to inconvenience him. Of course not. Abnegation sounds like a bunch of simps, mate. My gaze drifts from Susan to the dauntless tables across the room. They are laughing and chatting and playing cards. At another set of tables, the erudite chatter over books and newspapers in constant pursuit of knowledge. A group of Amity girls in yellow and red sit in a circle on the cafeteria floor, playing some kind of hand-slapping game involving a rhyming song. Oh my god, they're doing like... What's that pancake thing? Do you know what I mean? Patty cake, patty... I don't know. That's what children do. Every few minutes, I hear a chorus of laughter from them as someone is eliminated and has to go sit in the center of the circle. At the table next to them, candor boys make wide gestures with their hand. They appear to be arguing about something, but it must not be serious because some of them are still smiling. Here are the factions as follows. Crackheads, know-it-alls, hippies, and facts over feelings, Ben Shapiro assholes. Just so we're all in the same area. At the abnegation table, we sit quietly and wait. Faction customs dictate even idle behavior and supersede individual preference. <laughs> Sorry, I don't believe a 16 year old would talk like this. It sounds like a robot. I doubt all the erudite want to study all the time or that every candor enjoys a lively debate, but they can't defy the norms of their factions any more than I can. What a dull and non-threatening dystopia up until the end when it all kicks off for no reason. Caleb takes the aptitude test and so does Beatrice. Tris gets monitored by a dauntless called Tori. Hmm. Yeah, sure. Go on, have a cup of tea. Thank you, thank you. Do you, do you I, regret? I, do you, do would you, you regret, like a cup of tea? Who has a hawk tattoo? Why the hawk? I blurt out as she attaches an electrode to my forehead. Never met a curious abnegation before, she says, raising her eyebrows at me. I shiver and goosebumps appear on my arms. Calm down, love. My curiosity is a mistake, a betrayal of abnegation values. Tris isn't like the other girls because she asked a question. Tris gets attached to an electrode machine and drinks a liquid and hallucinates. That's a standard Tuesday for me. Where's my book and film deal? I started getting this really weird thing. Recently, I have trouble going to sleep. Just the going to sleep part. I can, once I'm sleeping, I'm good. But I have a lot of, and it's been getting a little bit worse recently, yeah? And I've been having this fun thing where I'll doze off for maybe a few minutes and then something will make me open my eyes to wake up. I don't know what. It's all anxiety related, right? And I'll see a spider. <laughs> It'll be like kind of the same color as you see when you close your eyes with dozens or hundreds of legs around it. And it will be there in my, Im in my image. In my image? Not in my image, I'm not God. In my vision for a few seconds. And the first time that this happened, I freaked the flip out. Oh, it was horrible. It's been happening a lot more recently. And it's still scary, even though I know I Googled all of this and it's some sort of like hip, no, da, 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 hip hallucination, essentially. And it's potentially linked with sleep paralysis, which I used to get a lot of. So that's fun. My sleep paralysis demon has just evolved into a spider to stalk me. So gross. I had it a lot last night because I'm on day two of my ADHD medication, getting the right abysmally, pathetically small dose. I've had to be... <laughs> There's some kind of national sort of shortage of the correct dose I need. I have a higher dose than it took a few times. So I was like, oh, no, not for me because it made me stay up till 8am. I spoke about this with Kay on a recent podcast episode. So I got told this is fine to do. I bought like some drug dealer scales, the little milligram ones. I bought some drug dealer plastic baggies, the little ones. And I've been opening up the capsules, weighing out the amount and then halving it and then having it with some water. And I was told by a few people, it's totally fine to do that because the capsules are just there to like, you know, be digested or whatever. So it's not really, it probably gets absorbed into the bloodstream in the same amount of time, maybe a little bit quicker. Not really a big deal. I've shoved way worse up my nose, you know? But I'm on day two of it and even on a pathetically small low dose, because I metabolize drugs a bit funny. I was up last night and this this spider thing happened a few times and it is so irritating. I was up to like 5 a.m. I am tired today. Anyway, when they open, an instant has passed, but I am somewhere else. When what open? Oh, her eyes. I stand in the school cafeteria again, but all the long tables are empty, and I see through the glass walls that it's snowing. On the table in front of me are two baskets. In one is a hunk of cheese, in the other, a knife the length of my arm. Behind me, a woman's voice says, choose. Why? I ask. 
choose, she repeats. Tris refuses to choose. What is that meant to mean anyway? Just a hunk of cheese? I'd have been a Hufflepuff because I definitely would have just gone for the cheese. <laughs> then a dog appears to attack Triss. So she acts submissive towards it and the dog chills out until a random child comes along. So Triss jumps on the dog to stop the dog from attacking the child. Then she sits next to a bloke on a bus who asks if she knows a murderer from the paper he's reading. They get into an argument and then she wakes up. That's it. That is the aptitude test. That is boring. It, it's just boring. <laughs> GCSE history exams are more interesting than that. For my GCSE history exam, we did World War II. For two years, we were learning about World War II. And when it came to the exam, there was a question for a good portion of the marks about the USSR. When we went back to my class afterwards, our history teacher asked us all how it went. And I said, sir, what is the USSR? We haven't learned anything about that. What's going on? And he actually face palmed because we'd been working on learning about this stuff for two years. Somehow I still pass history of good grades. I don't know how I managed, I do not know. That shocking twist is more interesting than this test. Chapter three. I've just realized that this book basically is in a dystopian society, one girl is different than the others because she has more than one personality trait. Tris thinks that she's failed the test. I sit forward and wipe my palms off of my slacks. I had to have done something wrong, even if it only happened in my mind. Is that strange look on Tori's face because she doesn't know how to tell me what a terrible person I am? I wish she would just come out of it. What in the self-deprecation is that? It is so contrived. It's the Bella Swan, oh, I'm so chagrined because everyone wants me dead due to their own emotional immaturity and somehow that's on me. That's my responsibility. That's my fault. I'm a terrible person. It's just, that went, that escalated so quick. That went zero to a hundred. I failed the test. I'm a terrible person. What are you talking about? Tori found Triss's test results strange. So she leaves the room for a moment whilst Triss sulks. Tori comes back and she doesn't have a clear conclusion for the aptitude test. Triss displays equal aptitude for abnegation, dauntless and erudite, which is not allowed, illegal, to the gulags with her. Headphone users, sorry. Tori calls her a detergent. She looks over her shoulder like she expects someone to hear, appear behind her. I called divergent. She says the last word so quietly that I almost don't hear it and her tense, worried look returns. She walks around the side of the chair and leans in close to me. Why is there no CCTV or anyone else monitoring the test results simultaneously? This society is pretty small, so the extra security wouldn't be a big deal. And it's an important test. It's fundamental towards their society. At the end, in the Dauntless headquarters, there are CCTV cameras everywhere, all around the pit and the chasm, blah, blah, blah. Like, and Tobias was aware of them, et cetera, et cetera. People listening in to their conversations, they have to be careful. So why are there not CCTV cameras within the test rooms and microphones and stuff? The control room that Tobias is in at the end, spoiler alert, is akin to the architect's control room within the Matrix Reloaded. To avoid a pot plot hole like this, just don't have CCTV invented in this world in the first place. Easy peasy. Tori tells Beatrice that divergence is dangerous, so keep it a secret and then Trish just goes home. I feel like she should be given a little bit more information than that. That's like if Hagrid said, you're a wizard, Ari. <laughs> Getting ready for Quidditch, are you? I can do it better than that, surely. You're a wizard, Ari. You're a wizard, Ari. <laughs> I sound like Selma and Patty from The Simpsons. He must have disappeared into fat air. Huh, huh, huh. When you come out of there, the first thing you're going to see is a man with a good job. Yeah, the doctor. <laughs> you're a wizard, Ari. I'm a what? A wizard, a thumping good and one hard wager. Get you trained up a little. But that's not possible. I'm Harry, just Harry. Just Harry. <laughs> but that would be like if Hagrid said, you're a wizard, Harry, and then just left him with the Dursleys. I decide not to take the bus. If I get home early, my father will notice when he checks the house log at the end of the day. What in the neuroticism is that? Oh, sure. The author thinks of this. Don't think of the CCTV conundrum. There's a group of people who don't belong to any factions from either rejection or choice, and they are called the factionless. Very inventive, I know. They live in poverty and do janitorial work. Something, something. This says a lot about our society. A factionless man asks Triss for some food, and then he dabs on her for no reason at all. He reaches for them, but instead of taking the bag, his hand closes around my wrist. He smiles at me. He has a gap between his front teeth. My, don't you have pretty eyes, he says. It's a shame the rest of you is so plain. 
Oh, to have the confidence of an average male. Bang out of order, bruv. Let go of me, I say. I hear ringing in my ears. My voice sounds clear and stern, not what I expected to hear. I feel like it doesn't belong to me. I am ready. I know what to do. I picture myself bringing my elbow back and hitting him. I see the bag of apples flying away from me. I hear my running footsteps. I am prepared to act. Triss proves to us that she is dauntless because she imagines hitting a homeless person. Nothing comes from this tiny bit of conflict, by the way. He just tells her to choose her house wisely and then lets go of her wrist. Chapter four. The houses on my street are all the same size and shape. They are made of gray cement with few windows in economical, no nonsense rectangles. Their lawns are crab grass and their mailboxes are dull metal. To some, the sight might be gloomy, but to me, their simplicity is comforting. Maybe this is a dystopia after all. The reason for the simplicity isn't disdain for uniqueness, as the other factions have sometimes interpreted it. Everything, our houses, our clothes, our hairstyles, is meant to help us forget ourselves and to protect us from vanity, greed and envy, which are just forms of selfishness. If we have little and want for little and we are all equal, we envy no one. This is my nightmare. My natural tendency towards sarcasm is still not appreciated. Sarcasm is always at someone else's expense. Maybe it's better that abnegation wants me to suppress it. This is a horror. Caleb returns home and asks her about her test, so she lies to him. I try to smile convincingly. I seem to have persuaded Susan and Robert, who no longer look concerned for my mental stability, but Caleb narrows his eyes at me, the way he does when he suspects someone of duplicity. I feel like narrowing your eyes at someone is a pretty universal trait of being suspicious, not just exclusive to Caleb. That's why you see people in cartoons do it. Triss's whole family have dinner. Marcus is my father's co-worker. They are both political leaders. The city is ruled by a council of 50 people, composed entirely of representatives from abnegation, because our faction is regarded as, as incorruptible due to our commitment to selflessness. Our leaders are selected by their peers for their impeccable character. Yeah, having only one form of representative in charge isn't doomed to fail, is it? Marcus has a son called Tobias, who left to be dauntless. The erudite keep complaining about abnegation in reports. I stare at my peas. I am not sure I can live this life of obligation any longer. I am not good enough. It wouldn't be a young adult book without the annoying, we I'm not good enough, thoughts over something stupid and inconsequential. I walk into my room and when I close my door behind me, I realize that the decision might be simple. It will require a great act of selflessness to choose abnegation or a great act of courage to choose dauntless. And maybe just choosing one over the other will prove that I belong. Tomorrow, those two qualities will struggle within me and only one can win there are two walls within you the one that's stronger is the one you feed this isn't an interesting dilemma i never thought i'd say this but twilight has better stakes than this newborn vampire army versus cullens and the werewolves and only one can win it's more interesting than oh my god which house should i pick chapter five a pale ring of sunlight burns into the clouds like the end of a lit cigarette i will never smoke one myself they are closely tied to vanity Oh yeah, nicotine addiction, how conceited. The uniform pounding of feet in my ears and the homogeneity of the people around me makes me believe that I could choose this. I could be subsumed into abnegation's hive mind, projecting always outward. Ah, I am very smart. Ah, I'm 14 and this is deep. This is also what it feels to chew five gum. I don't know why I wrote that. All the 16 year olds are making their choice of faction in the choosing ceremony. In the last circle are five metal bowls so large they could hold my entire body if I curled up. Each one contains a substance that represents each faction. Grey stones for abnegation, water for erudite, earth for amity, lit coals for dauntless, and glass for candor. Why am I getting flashbacks of authentic for air from the House of Night? This book is dull. It's boring. That is my number one criticism of it. It's not outrageously offensive and try hard like the House of Night series or rife with romanticization of abuse like Twilight. It's just... Dull. My ADHD cannot handle dull. Marcus blathers on and on and on. It's not interesting to recap, so I didn't bother. Anyone who changes factions is seen as a traitor by their original faction because othering and blaming is always better than self-reflection, I guess. Caleb chooses erudite, much to the chagrin of abnegation, and Triss chooses dauntless. Chapter six. If I had to see my parents one more time, I look over my shoulder at the last second before I pass them and immediately wish I hadn't. My father's eyes burn into mine with a look of accusation. At first, when I feel the heat behind my eyes, I think he's found a way to set me on fire to punish me for what I've done. But no, I'm about to cry. Beside him, my mother is smiling. This is a nice reversal because usually within books and media, 
the dad is always the secretly cool one and the mum is the shrill, messy, annoying one. So it's nice to see the mum is the cool one in this scenario. I will give you that book, but only that. I glance at the boy to my left, who was erudite and now looks as pale and nervous as I should feel. I spent all my time worrying about which faction I would choose and never considered what would happen if I chose Dauntless. What waits for me at the Dauntless headquarters? That sure is some oversight, dum-dum. The crowd of Dauntless leading us go to the stairs and serve the elevators. I thought only the abnegation used the stairs. Then everyone starts running. I hear whoops and shouts and laughter all around me and dozens of thundering feet moving at different rhythms. It is not a selfless act for the Dauntless to take the stairs. It is a wild act. When you take the stairs instead of the elevator, r slash mad lads. This book, so far, is so unfathomably dull, which is why I also think it's a cash grab. Follow a basic young adult dystopian generic formula. Make a modern sorting houses for the latest generation to put in their Twitter bios. Make sure there's just enough content for a free book series. Or, as what I reckon happened here, just make it up as you go along. Question marks. Profit. They run towards the train station as a train is coming in. They need to jump on it. How fast is this train going? It could be like zooming. It could be crawling along. I could do it easily, I bet. My toxic trait is thinking anything everyone else can do, I can do at least 10 times better. Oh, the train never stops, by the way. It just always goes round and round and round. I think it was called the train that couldn't slow down. A boy fails to jump onto the train, so he is immediately factionless. Get wrecked. Beatrice meets a girl called Christina, who is from Candor originally. Tris angst internally about her parents some more. They are approaching Dauntless headquarters and they will have to jump off the train soon. Recently, I read a book called The Fork, the Witch and the Worm by Christopher Paolini, the writer, the author of Aragon, the Aragon series. The Aragon books, I have a big softball. They are flawed and they're full of purple prose and they predictably follow a hero's journey type formula. But this recent addition to the series, he only wrote four years ago. And you know what? I really enjoy the way he writes, I think. Yes, yeah, like the first few books were too flowery, but the way he writes is very rich. You can visualize the scenes well. It feels like you've eaten a nice filling meal. In comparison to books like these, where the writing is really bare. So for me anyway, the imagery is always hard to imagine. It's like eating Burger King fries. They don't taste great and you're still left hungry afterwards. I really don't like Burger King fries. Like out of all the fast food fry tiers, tiered list, Burger King are like down at the bottom. Rubbish. An Amity boy declares that he won't jump. You've got to, Christina says, or you'll fail. Come on, it'll be all right. No, it won't. I'd rather be factionless than dead. The Amity boy shakes his head. He sounds panicky. He keeps shaking his head and staring at the rooftop, which is getting closer by a second. I don't agree with him. I would rather be dead than empty, like the factionless. These book characters, they never actually really comprehend what death means. Like Bella's the same. This is, of course, coming from someone who says, I would rather be dead at the tiniest of inconveniences. Tris and Christina jump and land. Everybody does except for the Amity boy. A dauntless girl jumps and misses the rooftop and dies. RIP, best character in the series. I tell myself as sternly as possible, that is how things work here. We do dangerous things and people die. People die and we move on to the next dangerous thing. The sooner that lesson sinks in, the better chance I have at surviving initiation. Bravery or stupidity, you decide. Some bloke called Max tells them all to jump off a ledge. It's just like what our mums always warned us about. Tris goes first, taking a literal leap of faith off of a building and into a hole in the ground. It's a bit like in Abe's Odyssey, where you're at the Mdukkan Temple and you have to do a leap of faith. But Abe's Odyssey is a well better structured and more interesting story than this is. She is caught by a net. She rolls off the net into the arms of some hunk. I hate myself. He is the young man attached to the hand I grabbed. He has a spare upper lip and full lower lip. His eyes are so deep set that his eyelashes touch the skin under his eyebrows and they are dark blue, a dreaming, sleeping, waiting colour. Is this an Aesion? Or has science finally discovered the missing link? Beatrice gets to pick a new name. So she picks Tris. And then everyone claps. I'm not joking. A crowd materializes from the darkness as my eyes adjust. They cheer and pump their fists and then another person drops into the net. Her scream follows her down, Christina. Everyone laughs, but they follow their laughter with more cheering. Four sets his hand on my back and says, welcome to Dauntless. Chapter seven. They go through some tunnels. These guys live in a cave. I bet they're all vitamin D deficient. 
that's not very dauntless of them. You need vitamin D to do stuff with, I'm sure. Vitamin D for deficient. Also, screw tunnels and caves. I got myself into a rabbit hole the other night of reading about incidents like the Nutty Putty cave death and people dying, doing like spelunking and stuff. No, thank you. Mm -mm, not for me, mate. Anision's name is four because he is very special. Pit. Is, this is where they live. That four isn't also called pit. Pit is the best word for it. It is an underground cavern so huge I can't see the other end of it from where I stand at the bottom. Uneven rock walls rise several stories above my head. Built into the stone walls are places for food, clothing, supplies, leisure activities. Narrow paths and steps carved from rock connect them. There are no barriers to keep people from falling over the side. Dads would love it here. So you finally decided to come out of your pit, have you? A slant of orange light stretches across one of the rock walls. Forming the roof of the pit are panes of glass and above them a building that lets in sunlight. It must have looked like just another city building when we passed it on the train. I, even when I read this last year, I have never been able to imagine what this looks like. I was just thinking of a cave. So I Googled people's artistic interpretations of this fan art and other people have got some Lords of the Rings, Minds of Moria shit. I didn't imagine that at all. There's also a rushing river called the Chasm. The pit, the chasm. What next? The abyss? You stare at this book too long and the abyss stares back? You stare at young adult dystopian novels too long and money signs stare back? Four leads the group of initiates across the pit towards a gaping hole in the wall. The room beyond is well lit enough that I can see where we're going. A dining hall full of people and clattering silverware. Why does this just sound like Harry Potter? Like the, the Slytherin dungeons. When we walk in, the dauntless inside stand. They applaud, they stamp their feet, they shout. The noise surrounds me and fills me. Christina smiles and a second later, so do I. All of this whooping and cheering. These books are always so American centric because they're written by American novelists. Funny that. I have never been whooped or cheered at in my life. That's because in England, all of us not so secretly despise each other. We look for empty seats. Christina and I discover a mostly empty table at the side of the room and I find myself sitting between her and four. In the center of the table is a platter of food I don't recognize. Circular pieces of meat wedged between round bread slices. I pinch one between my fingers, unsure of what to make of it. Four nudges me with his elbow. It's beef, he says. Put this on it. He passes me a small bowl full of red sauce. You've never had a hamburger before? Asks Christina, her eyes wide. She has never had a hamburger before. Everyone knows that former Supreme Leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, first created the hamburger, or as we like to call it, double bread with minced meat. Catchy title, innit? The doors to the cafeteria open and a hush falls over the room. I look over my shoulder. A young man walks in and it is quiet enough that I hear his footsteps. His face is pierced in so many places I use count, and his hair is long, dark and greasy, but that isn't what makes him look menacing. It is the coldness of his eyes as they sweep across the room. This is Eric, he is one of the leaders of the Dauntless, aka Severus Snape, with piercings. Dauntless are literally my immortal reimaginings of Harry Potter characters. Are they friends? My eyes flick between Eric and Four. Everything Eric did, sitting here, asking about Four, suggests that they are. But the way Four sits, tense has pulled wire, suggests they are something else. Rivals, maybe. But how could that be, if Eric is a leader and Four is not? Why are you asking me? I barely care. Triss asks Four questions, so he gets stroppy, and then she gets stroppy too. This is basically their entire relationship for the trilogy, by the way. The initiates will have to be trained and then ranked. Only the top 10 will be made members of Dauntless and the remaining teens will be cut and made factionless, which absolutely is not fair. That is not a good system to have. Are you saying that if you had known this before the choosing ceremony, you wouldn't have chosen Dauntless, Eric snaps? Because if that's the case, you should get out now. If you really are one of us, it won't matter to you that you might fail. And if it does, you are a coward. I mean, it's not bravery to sign up for something that you have zero knowledge of beforehand. It's just daft it's just a lack of foresight it's bedtime and tris has a tiny private cry in her bed so does another boy his feet are just inches from my head that's my dystopia i should comfort him i should want to comfort him because i was raised that way instead i feel disgust someone who looks so strong shouldn't act so weak why can't he just keep his crying quiet like the rest of us you do realize that there is bravery and strength in showing compassion for others you hypocrite, you're crying as well. My problem might be that even if I did go home, I wouldn't belong there among people who give without thinking and care without trying. 
Another trope in the young adult formula to relate to your teenage audience is have characters bemoan about just not belonging, even if what they don't belong to is really stupid in the first place. Chapter eight. The first thing you will learn today is how to shoot a gun. America, fuck yeah. No, I shouldn't be saying fuck, should I? Well, I'm not too late, too late. I don't care anymore. So in this world, they have these extremely high-tech serums that can make people hallucinate simulations controlled by an external overseer and they have guns and tracking technology so i would assume access to radio and gps i'm assuming i ain't a scientist i'm an engineer i'm just assuming but no one here has, seems to have a tv or a phone hmm there is a bad boy called peter but what peter yawns for his words what does firing a gun have to do with bravery four flips the gun in his hand and presses the barrel to peter's forehead and clicks a bullet into place Peter freezes with his lips parted, the yawn dead in his mouth. Wake up, Four snaps. You are holding a loaded gun, you idiot. Act like it. Legend. They do target practice and Triss misses the most. It takes me five rounds to hit the middle of the target. And when I do, a rush of energy goes through me. I'm awake, my eyes wide open, my hands warm. I lower the gun. There is power in controlling something that could do so much damage in controlling something, period. Old white dudes in the US Senate to women's bodies be like. Ooh, political joke, ooh. Triss is a very nothing narrator. She's almost this completely blank slate for the reader to self-insert into. And it's very clear that that is the purpose of her being so nothing and I don't appreciate it. They finish shooting up and go to lunch. Edward and Myra, the other erudite transfers, sit two tables away, so close that they bump elbows as they cut into their food. Myra pauses to kiss Edward. I watch them carefully. I've only seen a few kisses in my life. Incel. Do they have to be so public? I say. <laughs> Elliot Rogers looking ass. She just kissed him. Al frowns at me. When he frowns, his thick eyebrows touch his eyelashes. It's not like they're stripping naked. A kiss is not something you do in public. He is hardly balls deep in her on top of all of the double breads with minced meats, now is he? It's after lunch and Four teaches the students how to beat up a boxing bag. You don't have much muscle, he says, which means you're better off using your knees and elbows. You can put more power behind them. Suddenly he presses a hand to my stomach. That's a bit rude. His fingers are so long that though the heel of his hand touches one side of my rib cage, his fingertips still touch the other side. My heart pounds so hard my chest hurts and I stare at him wide-eyed. Either he has like slender man fingers or Triss is just so teeny and weeny. Where? After lessons, they go clove shopping. Ebony Darkness Dementia Raven Way puts on a black dress and some eyeliner. My eyes were blue before, but a dull greyish blue. The eyeliner makes them piercing. With my hair framing my face, my features look softer and fuller. I am not pretty. My eyes are too big and my nose too long. Oh yeah. The sign of not, someone not being pretty. Big eyes. What are you talking about? But I can see that Christina is right. My face is noticeable. Of course, our protagonist isn't pretty, like those other pretty girls, but she is noticeable, of course. They did this with Bella Swan too. Make her call herself not pretty, not attractive, even though half the boys within the books drool after her. I presume this is to try to make the character approachable and relatable for the reader, which is such a dunk on the readers of these books that I would be insulted. They go to the tattoo parlor afterwards. Abnegation sees art as impractical. Abnegation are basically devout beyond reasonable religious zealots. That is some Old Testament shit right there. Tori, that hawk lady, works at the tattoo shop. Thanks, I touched the sketch of the bird. Listen, I need to talk to you about, I glanced over at Will and Christina. I can't corner Tori now, their last questions. Something, sometime. I'm not sure that would be wise, she says quietly. I helped you as much as I could. Now you have to go do it alone. You didn't tell her anything. My work is done here. What do you mean your work is done? You didn't do anything. <laughs> didn't I? Triss gets a tattoo of three birds, one for each family member. I'm gonna get a tattoo of three middle fingers, one for each of these books. Chapter nine. Today is a fighting day between the initiates. Triss has no partner because there's an odd number of students. Christina complains about the other Candor initiate. Peter is pure evil. When we were kids, he would pick fights with people from other factions. And then when an adult came to break it up, he'd cry and make up some story about how the other kids started it. And of course they believed him because we were Candor and we couldn't lie, ha ha. Yeah, it's almost as if dividing people into one personality trait per group is flawed. 
Also to note, at the end of this book, Peter is found and he says, whilst everyone else is in the simulation, he says that they took him out of the simulation. It's never given a reason why they would do it, the higher ups in Dauntless taking him out of the simulation. He would be more useful to them as a mind controlled soldier. Why would they just pick him randomly to take him out of it? So my fan theory is that maybe Peter is actually just slightly divergent. Two students are fighting, but stop. After a few seconds of circling, Eric shouts, do you think this is a leisure activity? Should we break for nap time? Fight each other. But Al straightens, letting his hands down and says, is it scored or something? When does the fight end? It ends when one of you is unable to continue, says Eric. According to Dauntless Rules, Four says, one of you could also concede. Eric narrows his eyes at Four. According to the old rules, he says, in the new rules, no one concedes. This is stupid. A brave man acknowledges the strength of others, Four replies. A brave man never surrenders even after. Al knocks Will out and Will wakes up as a lizard and realizes that this was all a dream, the end. If conflict in Dauntless ends with only one person standing, I am unsure of what this part of the initiation will do to me. Will I be Al, standing over a man's body, knowing I'm the one who put him on the ground? Or will I be Will, lying in a helpless heap? And is it selfish of me to crave victory or is it brave? I wipe my sweaty palms on my pants. Pretty sure that is just called survival instinct. Molly beats the shit out of Christina until she begs her to stop so Eric gets big mad and drags Christina out to the river. Climb over the railing, says Eric again, pronouncing each word slowly. If you can hang over the chasm for five minutes, I will forget your cowardice. If you can't, I will not allow you to continue initiation. I don't think having initiates beat each other unconscious is a good way to show bravery. If I help her, Eric would make my fate the same as hers. Will I let her fall to her death or will I resign myself to being factionless? What's worse, to be idle while someone dies or to be exiled and empty handed? My parents would have no problem answering that question, but I am not my parents. Wouldn't bravery be to take the risk of being factionless to help a friend who is close to dying? Risking yourself and your future to save someone else's life is courage as well as selfless. Yeah. That's why these factions don't really make that much sense because they can conflate and cross over like that. Selflessness and bravery are quite linked, you know? Christina survives the railing. Fine, Eric says, you can come up, Christina. Al walks towards the railing. No, Eric says, she has to do it on her own. No, she doesn't, Al growls. She did what you said. She's not a coward. She did what you said. Al is the truly brave one here. Defy authority, rebel, rebel. Chapter 10. Wait, 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 hold on a second. Stop the video because I have merch now. Yes, we've finally done it. I have merch, I have a merchandise store. We have four different designs and a range of products to choose from. This is the don't care, didn't ask. You know when someone just keeps going on and on and on about something you really don't care about? Well, hit them with one of these. My God, look at that coloring, the tasteful off-white thickness of it. Everything you see here is as eco-friendly as I could have made it. Items are recycled where possible, organic, sustainable, carbon neutral, the prints are all vegan. The supplier that I'm using even has a recycling scheme, so when your clothes get to the end of their life, you can send them back and then they can be remade and recycled into new things. Isn't that amazing? Not only that, but the clothes these factories are made in, in the UK, are powered by renewable energy. I know, I've outdone myself this time. <laughs> So let's get on to the designs. We have the don't care, didn't ask. We have it in the relaxed jumper. Here we have a jumper, which in Japanese says you may. In English, this means famous, as in, why am I not famous yet? We also have Elise in katakana on various items. And the piece de resistance is our die, cry, hate line, a parody of live, laugh, love. We have a puzzle made of recycled cardboard featuring die, cry, hate. For all the masochists out there who really enjoy really, really, really hard puzzles, look at all the white pieces, you'd be crazy to buy this one. Not only that, we have the tote bag to carry around all of your um, precious items in and the tie-dye limited edition cry, die, hate t-shirt. So where can all this be found? I'm glad you asked. The website is AY Clothing, as in a, as in A Lameo, ayclothing.tmail.com. I'll put the links in the description. You can head over there if you would like to buy some merchandise to support the channel or just tell the world what you really think of them. Don't care, don't ask, die, cry, hate. I'm really excited to be putting this merchandise out to the world. It's just, we've been working on this for a really, really long time and it's amazing to see it finally come to fruition. No, it's not true.
don't trust any YouTuber when they tell you they've been working years on something. But this has been fun. I have wanted to do merchandise for a while, but I wanted something that wasn't going to be the usual kind of thing. I wanted it to stand separately on its own, as if it could be a brand of its own, maybe. We'll just see how it goes. But I also really wanted something to combat the live, laugh lovers of the world. So here we are, my demotivational merchandise line. If it goes well, then we will do a second drop in the future, but only if it goes well. So, you know, let me know if you guys want there to be a second drop. I'll know that by if I make any sales. And the artist I use for this project is my good friend, Jenny Pond. Her links will be in the description as well. So head over to ayclothing.tmail.com if you'd like to buy some merchandise. Now, on with the video. Peter sprays stiff onto Triss's mattress so Al helps Triss clean it off. There are worse ways to be remembered. At least they won't antagonize you. There are better ways too. He nudges me with his elbow. First jumper. She's not pretty, but he's in love with her. Triss's opponent is Peter. I can't imagine that is fair considering he's a whole foot taller than her, but these idiots do think that bravery equals death wish. I got bored and distracted because even with Triss's impending conflict with Peter, it's just so dry to read. So I did some Googling instead about Divergent and I found this quote from Vox. Perhaps more importantly, the Divergent franchise has nowhere near the cultural impact of its peers. No one is graffitiing quotes from Divergent around Ferguson, Missouri, as a political protest. No one is making millions by self-publishing their Divergent fanfic. Oh my God, I bet I could. I'll just fill it with loads of vegan sausage rolls. No one hates Divergent as much as they hate Twilight and no one loves it as much as they love The Hunger Games or Harry Potter. Very true, isn't it? And there's also this quote from an article that I didn't source in my notes. I suppose you could just Google the words I'm saying, right? Okay, now that we have the basics, what is the economy like? Roth doesn't tell us. Then what world-shattering event led to the formation of the factions? It says they were formed by different people who believed those were the most important traits, but not why. No bad weather, no nuclear war, no civil war, no raising tides, nothing, nada. Then why is Lake Michigan an effing marsh? Not only that, but do you know how many cities there are on the edges of Lake Michigan? How are they not fighting Chicago over water if it's scarce? I actually saw a video that went into this as well. There is zero world building in these books beyond the explanation of the factions. And Wired said this, Divergent has always been the Buzzfeed quiz of young adult fiction. That is a more damning critique than I could even hope to dream up. Molly fights with Edward. That seems to be all that this training is. They were shown some moves and now they have to fight each other. It takes ages to learn how to fight properly but they've all been thrown in the deep end to blindly kick and punch at each other. It's just, it's dumb. Triss and Peter fight. Despite Peter being really strong and taller, Triss keeps getting up after being punched and kicked several times. I suppose we're meant to think that this is because she has inner strength, but I guarantee someone raised like how she was in abnegation would be down after the second punch, maybe even the first punch. You can kill someone with a punch, you know what I mean? She finally gets knocked out. She wakes up and her friends are there talking about their fights. I can't believe you couldn't beat Will, Al says, shaking his head. What? He's good, she says, shrugging. Plus, I think I finally learned how to stop losing. I just need to stop people from punching me in the jaw. Why aren't they getting taught how to fight properly? <laughs> they go straight from this initiation period to being given jobs, or they're meant to, but it all goes crazy at the end of this book. That's what they're meant to do. This isn't an adequate way to train fighters for army or defensive roles, especially like when you consider that like, some of them just get jobs guarding the outer walls right? Some of them have been trying, like the Dauntless Born initiates have probably been learning to fight all their lives, but the other initiates haven't been. So what, they just do this for a month and then, oh, that's it. You're off to go defend the city now. Good luck. It's ridiculous. And don't pay attention to Christina. Your face doesn't look that bad. He smiles a little. I mean, it looks good. It always looks good. I mean, you look brave. Dauntless. What a simp. This is Al, by the way. His eyes skirt mine and he scratches the back of his head. The silence seems to grow between us. It was a nice thing to say, but he acts like it meant more than just the words. I hope I am wrong. I could not be attracted to Al. I could not be attracted to anyone that fragile. He knocked out some other bloke. He's harder than you. This inner hardness within Triss, to me, is not believable. She thinks that weakness is the opposite of bravery and thus hates weakness, but why? 
what what compels her? Is it just because she was brought up to be selfless? Triss is like the template of strong female character without having any further depth or introspection to her shallow reasonings. Why is she the way she is? There is little in the way of character development and world bo the world boring. Yeah, world well, boring, all right. World building, because this book is shallow, hence cash grab. He looks down. I just can't do it. Maybe that means I'm a coward. You're not a coward just because you don't want to hurt people, I say, because I know it's the right thing to say, even if I'm not sure I mean it. Being brave doesn't mean going around hitting people in the face, but thank God that this book is getting a little bit more ridiculous because it's been dry AF up until now. Triss angst over her parents again. Maybe if I could have told them I was divergent and I was confused about what to choose, they would have understood. Maybe they would have helped me figure out what divergence is and what it means and why it's dangerous. But I didn't trust them with that secret, so I will never know. To me, this conflict isn't very compelling because it's too mysterious to be that interesting. Oh, you're divergent, but don't tell anyone because it is dangerous and you will be killed. But what does that mean for me? What is divergence? What does it mean? Give me something, anything. Not telling, bye. That's how people have acted with her and do act with her. I can't get that engaged with it. I don't know. I clench my teeth as the tears come. I'm fed up. I'm fed up with tears and weakness, but there isn't much I can do to stop them. She was just slagging Al off for the same thing. She's a hypocrite. Chapter 11. I got bored again during this. So I went onto Reddit to see what other people thought of it. Someone on Reddit said that Divergent was a panic publication and production from a rival agency in response to the Hunger Games. No citation, no source, big if true though. Another person said, I think it's important to remember though that Veronica Roth was 22 when she published those. For a 22 year old, it's impressive. Absolutely not, I disagree. Paolini, Christopher Paolini was 15 when he wrote Aragon. Yes, Aragon is basically just Star Wars except with dragons, completely derivative. And yet, that is more impressive than this snooze fest. Boring. So they're all going out somewhere and they get on the train. Feeling okay there? Peter says, giving me a look of mock sympathy. His lips turned down, his arched eyebrows pulled in. Or are you a little stiff? This has all the threat of a Jack Joseph American high school bully skit. They are two seconds away from dancing and snapping their fingers at each other. It's like West Side Story. Triss has an interest in four, even though he's barely said a few paragraphs in total, but he's mysterious and broody and, and muscly and stuff. So I guess that makes up for it. Follow me, says four. I stay close to Christina. I don't want to admit it, not even to myself, but I feel calmer when I'm near her. If Peter tries to taunt me, she will defend me. Silently, I scold myself for being such a coward. Peter's insults shouldn't bother me and I should focus on getting better at combat, not on how badly I did yesterday. And I should be willing, if not able, to defend myself instead of relying on other people to do it for me. Triss has this real hang up about being seen as weak, hating weakness, etc. And yet she was born into a tribe that values selflessness above all. And she has been socially conditioned to hold this value. But not as much as her father or her friends from that faction, hence why she has transferred. So I don't think it makes sense that she has this natural, almost inherent drive to hate weakness, must be strong, must only rely on self. People aren't born strong. They're not born anything. Tabula, tabula rasa. Oh, check me out. Retaking A-level philosophy because I failed the first time round because I got too stoned. Which is ironic, really. It's philosophy. I mean, come on. It's the stoner subject. Either put on these glasses. I start eating that trash can. I already am eating from the trash can all the time. It's not really, it's the crackhead subject. Genetically, you can be predisposed to having the capacity to have physical strength, but without the environmental push, you probably won't fill up said capacity. The upbringing that she has had is counterintuitive to what she wants. So I just think it's a bit strange that there is this almost compulsive drive within her to expel any weakness. And I don't think it's a natural compulsion. It doesn't feel natural within the text. It feels very forced and very author driven. Maybe if we just knew more about her, had more insight to her character, maybe some memories of, of, of stuff, maybe then it would be more believable, but she's a shallow two dimensional character. So, Mm -hmm. If you don't rank in the top five at the end of initiation, you'll probably end up here, says Four, as he reaches the gate. Once you are a fence guard, there is some potential for advancement, but not much. You may be able to go on patrols beyond Amity's farms, but... Patrols for what purpose? asks Will. 
four lifts a shoulder. I suppose you'll discover that if you find yourself amongst them. As I was saying, for the most part, those who guard the fence when they are young continue to guard the fence. If it comforts you, some of them insist that it isn't as bad a job as it seems. Oh no, what a terrible dystopia having to... Work a boring job. Four's rank was number one, but he didn't want a government job. Whilst writing this, I got a flashback to being 20 years old myself and writing a dystopia about young people and an uprising against the government. The, just, the, the evil government, why are they evil? Don't know, I don't, I didn't really go into it. But the government catches these rebels, these insurgents, and secretly makes the protagonist a prisoner and tries to turn them into a super soldier. As you can predict, it was terrible. It was shallow, it was superficial, there was no real message, meaning, theme, anything like that to it. It was abysmal. It was fragile. The plot was like touching a butterfly's wings. It would fall apart at the slightest exertion of pressure. That story that I tried to write is like this story, which makes me an idiot, king shit of idiot mountain, I should have finished that story. I should have barely edited it. I should have just sent it off for publication because this was probably around the time of The Hunger Games 2. And I would have made possibly millions of pounds on a susceptible young adult teenage audience. I am the worst. But regarding the world building, why are they in this dystopia in the first place? What happened to cause the factions? Why is there no contact with other cities or anything outside the walls? Who knows? I don't. I know a lot gets explained out of the author's arse by the third book, but having next to no world building in the first book is pretty lazy. It's expecting a lot from the reader to have to sit through almost 1500 pages in total just to get some kind of answers. Bad answers by the end at that. You can world build and still retain mystery. My God, I don't know why I wrote that in my script. I was watching a lot of Slavoj Žižek. My God. Robert, the boy from the beginning from Abnegation, transferred over to Amity and sees Triss whilst del delivering apples. If Abnegation is fizzling, it's our fault. Robert's and Caleb's are mine. Mine. I push the thought from my mind. Or it's the faction's fault for being so boring that I want to spit. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even eat hamburgers. Can you blame them for transferring? Beatrice demands a nasal voice next to me. Molly folds her arms and laughs. Is that your real name, Stiff? I glance at her. What did you think Triss was short for? Oh, I don't know. Weakling? She touches her chin. If her chin was bigger, it might balance out her nose, but it is weak and almost recedes into her neck. Oh, wait. That doesn't start with Triss. My mistake. I'm embarrassed for Veronica Roth that she wrote this. This is what I choose. This is it. I look over Robert's shoulder. The dauntless guard seem to have finished examining the truck. The bearded man gets back into the driver's seat and closes the door behind him. Besides, Robert, the goal of my life isn't just to be happy. She's not like the other girls because she doesn't want to... This is me spinning a wheel. Be happy. Look at the showmanship and the production that goes into these videos around here that no one appreciates, but okay. Before I can answer, he touches my shoulder and turns towards the truck. A girl in the back has a banjo on her lap. She starts to strum it as Robert, shut up, brain, hoists himself inside and the truck starts forward, carrying the banjo sounds and her warbling voice away from us. Whenever I think of banjos, I just think of that, like the banjos that's always used in cartoons. Four comes along to touch Triss's eyeball in an attempt at foreplay. Ha! Foreplay. See what I did there? I hate myself. Triss is like, you left in my fight you didn't watch. And four is all, I didn't want to watch. And she's like, oh my God, what does this possibly mean? Chapter 12. Even though I'm so injured, I had to fight again today. Luckily this time, I was paired against Myra, who couldn't throw a good punch if someone was controlling her arm for her. I got a good hit in during the first two minutes. She fell down and was too dizzy to get back up. I should feel triumphant, but there is no triumph in punching a girl like Myra. This isn't an effective way to train anyone, just having them wail on each other until something happens. Eric wakes all the initiates up to go on a field trip. They are going paintballing. This is a faction for teenagers. All they do is fight each other, get tattoos and mess around. What economy is there within this city? How does it work? Tell me, please, just a crumb. They are playing capture the flag with paintball guns. Four picks Triss for his team. 
Angry. I should definitely be angry. I scowl at my hands. Whatever Forge strategy is, it's based on the idea that I am weaker than the other initiates, and it gives me a bitter taste in my mouth. I have to prove him wrong. I have to. Where is this drive to not be seen as weak coming from? It's just there for the sake of being there, but there's no real reason giving for it or deeper introspection. It's just this trait written in by the author to make Triss seem more interesting than she really is. But when you try to dig deeper, it falls apart. The author is just trying to make her character different from the others. Ooh. Eric and Four split everyone into two teams. Four picks people with smaller bodies for better aerodynamics. They head towards the marsh that was a lake. I'm gonna link the YouTube video that I watched about the inaccuracy of this. This book feels like a first draft. When you write a first draft, you don't worry about things being logical or possible. You just get the words out and deal with it later. It's future use problem to deal with. The editing stages are for the fine tuning and making sure that things make sense. I think Divergent completely skipped over the editing process. Marlene takes out a flashlight and shines it at the street in front of us. Scared of the dark, Ma, the dark-eyed, dauntless-born initiate teases. If you want to step on broken glass, Uria, be my guest, she snaps, but she turns it off anyway. I have realized that part of being dauntless is being willing to make things more difficult for yourself in order to be self-sufficient. There's nothing especially brave about wandering dark streets with no flashlights, but we are not supposed to need help, even from the light. We are supposed to be capable of anything. This is regressive and stupid. If God wanted you to walk around in the dark, he wouldn't have invented light bulbs. I like that. Because there might come a day when there is no flashlight, there is no gun, there is no guiding hand, and I want to be ready for it. Well, one day you might not have access to clothes, but I don't see anyone walking around naked. We walk down the side of the pier. All the buildings on my left are empty, their signs torn down, their windows closed, but it's a clean kind of emptiness. Whoever left these places left them by choice and at their leisure. Some places in the city are not like that. Oh, it'd be nice if we had more world building so as to imagine what happened, but fuck me, I guess. Everyone argues about how to win the game. Do you know what's less interesting than playing sports? Reading about them. Oh. Triss decides to climb the Ferris wheel. There's a, there's a Ferris wheel. To see if she can spot the opposing team, but she doesn't bother telling her own teammates about this. So good one. My heart pumps faster. Will I really risk my life for this? To win a game the Dauntless like to play? I'm um, not fussed, mate. This is self-inflicted nonsense. I don't care. Triss, a low voice says behind me. I don't know why it doesn't startle me. Maybe because I'm becoming dauntless and mental readiness is something that I'm supposed to develop. Maybe because his voice is low and smooth and almost soothing. She's been with dauntless for a week. What a load of crap. Four joins Triss, of course he does. But I'm not really listening because the height is dizzying. My hands ache from holding the rungs, my legs are shaking, but I'm not sure why. It isn't the height that scares me. The height makes me feel alive with energy. Every organ and vessel and muscle in my body singing at the same pitch. Then I realize what it is. It's him. Something about him makes me feel like I'm about to fall or turn to liquid or burst into flames. Fall, 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 fall. Triss was saying that she's a hundred foot off the ground. And at first I thought that is absolute nonsense. What shit are you chatting fam? So I Googled it and Chicago has a Ferris wheel called the Centennial wheel. And it is massive, like grossly obscene. It's obscene. It's fetishization. It's just obscenity. My new toxic trait is calling everything a fetishization because that's what Savoy Shishek does. I was imagining, uh, I was honestly, the first time I read this, I imagined a Ferris wheel as small as one of those traveling funfair ones that are probably like 20 or 30 feet high. The way that I had to Google information about Chicago to get a better sense of the city that Triss is in also shows that the writing just isn't good enough by itself. I did more Googling after this, because I was curious. And when people talked of things like Lake Michigan, I didn't actually realize that lakes that big existed. Because when you look at pictures in Google, you can see that there's a beach next to this ferret wheel, Ferris, ferret wheel, a wheel of ferrets, this Ferris wheel, right? It's like a mini ocean. So I understand why that bloke made a video about it being ludicrous that Lake Michigan supposedly just dried up into a marsh. Because what would that do to the ecology of the, what would that do to the landscape? That is a massive body of water. I didn't realize the lakes could be there. I was thinking like, I don't know, just, well, how long's a piece of string, right? The lakes that I've always been to just aren't really that big. Like you can walk around them, the lakes that I've been to. Anyway, no more distractions, let's get on with it. This is why these videos are always so bloody long. They see the other team and climb back down, but a bar breaks and Triss is dangling. 
I try to find another place to put my foot, but the nearest foothold is a few feet away, further than I can stretch. My hands are sweaty. I remember wiping them on my slacks before the choosing ceremony, before the aptitude test, before every important moment and suppress a scream. I will slip. I will slip. This is so emotionless, I cannot muster up the strength to care. She could die and it reads like reading a takeaway menu. I feel more emotion over ordering a Chinese. Somehow Thor gets the Ferris wheel moving, so Triss is lowered to the ground and dropped safely. So the Ferris wheel survived a nameless, contextless war and has had, I'm assuming, no maintenance and yet it still works. I'm pretty sure that this is dauntless territory. And I don't think any of them are engineers because it, it's just never said, right? So why is the wheel still working? Or if they have done maintenance on the wheel, why haven't they fixed up the rest of the city already? It's just, it's just convenient, I suppose. It's convenient in this moment. Triss formulates a plan to capture the flag and runs. I have to run twice as fast to match my short strides to her long ones. As I run, I realise that only one of us will get to touch the flag and it won't matter that it was my plan and my information that got us to it if I'm not the one who grabs it. Though I can hardly breathe as it is, I run faster and I'm on Christina's heels. I pull my gun around my body, holding my finger over the trigger. That's not very safe. Their gun safety training sucks. Of course, at this point, I actually forgot that they were playing paintball and I thought that she had a real gun and they were going to all shoot each other over capture the flag. My mistake. Christina and Triss both get to the flag, so Christina patronises Triss and takes the flag. They go back to Hogwarts. Someone called Marlene introduces herself. Yeah, I know who you are, she says. The first jumper tends to stick in your head. It has been years since I jumped off a building in my abnegation uniform. It has been decades. It's been a week. Tell you what though, it's been years since I started this review. It's been decades. It'll be centuries by the time I'm finished. Chapter 13. Today they will all learn how to aim by throwing daggers at a target. But I know what she means. Judging by the poisonous look Eric gives for when he isn't paying attention, last night's loss must have bothered Eric more than he let on. Winning capture the flag is a matter of pride, and pride is important to the dauntless, more important than reason or sense. People who don't have much going on in their lives to distract their attention will tend to get pissy over stupid and consequential shit like this. It is literally like the drama in Love Island. Katniss. No wait, Triss uses the power of her mind to throw the knife and is a better aimer than the others. It must have been because of all the knife throwing that they were doing back in abnegation. Al isn't doing very well, so Eric tries to make him walk in front of the throwing knives. Again, I don't think this is a good way to train people for an army, but what would I know? No, he says. Why not? Eric's beady eyes fix on Al's face. Are you afraid? Of getting stabbed by an airborne knife, says Al. Yes, I am. Honesty is his mistake, not his refusal, which Eric might have accepted. I think the Dauntless believe that having no fear is the same as being brave. Fear is good. It keeps you grounded and sensible and less likely to do dumb shit and get yourself killed. The Dauntless are simply reckless, not brave. They should have all died out ages ago from jumping off of buildings if they all have this attitude. Eric makes Al stand in front of the target. I squeeze my hands into fists. No matter how casual four sounds, the question is a challenge and Thor doesn't often challenge Eric directly. This will be hard for me to explain because it's a very subjective feeling that I get when I'm reading books like this, but these books tend to over-dramatize every interaction had, and it's hard for me to retain interest when the characters are all so shallow and boring and talk boringly. We know barely anything about anyone else. Why should I care that Al is gonna have knives chucked at his head? Why should I care that Thor wants to challenge Eric's authority? I don't. And because I don't, I don't have the reaction that the author would want, which in this case would be, oh my God, the question is a challenge. Whatever will happen next? Oh my God, what is he doing? I'm just not that invested. Triss intervenes, so Eric tells her to stand in Al's place. There goes your pretty face, hisses Peter. Oh wait, you don't have one. Sick burn, mate. Four throws knives at Triss. Legend. Shut up, Thor. I hold my breath as he turns the last knife in his hand. I see a glint in his eyes as he pulls his arm back and lets the knife fly. It comes straight at me, spinning, blade over handle. My body goes rigid. This time, when it hits the board, my ear stings and blood tickles my skin. I touch my ear. He nicked it. And judging by the look he gives me, he did it on purpose. Core abuse? I love it when a boy pierces my ear for me. Eric says, I should keep my eye on you, he adds. Fear prickles inside me, in my chest and in my forehead and in my hands. I feel like the word divergent is branded on my forehead. And if he looks at me long enough, he'll be able to read it. But he just lifts his hand from my shoulder and keeps walking. At this point in the story, we don't know what divergence really is or why it's so dangerous. So the attempts at having some stakes does fall a little bit flat because we are just too in the dark about it. At this point, it could mean anything from she's a ticking time bomb 
waiting to explode or she could go super saiyan or she could turn into a hamster. We just don't know. Everyone leaves, so Triss and Thor begin arguing, which lasts for all of 10 sentences, and then the chapter suddenly ends. I saw someone describe Divergent as alternative universe fan fiction of a different book series, and I agree, except I've read some decent fan fiction before that was well better than this. Chapter 14. It is the day before the visiting day. I try to pull a pant leg over my thigh and it just sticks above my knee. Frowning, I stare at my leg. A bulge of muscle is stopping the fabric. I let the pant leg fall and look over my shoulder at the back of my thigh. Another muscle stands out there. I step to the side so I stand in front of the mirror. I see muscles that I couldn't see before in my arms, legs and stomach. I pinch my side where a layer of fat used to hint at some curves to come. Nothing. Dauntless initiation has stolen whatever softness my body had. Is that good or bad? It has been a week. So how? How does she have this muscle jumping off of trains and getting punched in the face a few times doesn't constitute as a consistent muscle building exercise i'm pretty sure though i'm not an expert don't sue me it should take weeks and months to see muscles tone and build it also takes good nutrition the only thing we were told that she's eaten is some hamburgers who knows Triss is in a towel and the big mean bullies are in the dorm. So Peter pulls the towel off of her as she runs away holding her dress. She vows to hurt them for this. Back in the sparring room, Triss is to fight Molly. Triss uses her speed to beat Molly and then Triss goes apeshit. She kicks Molly repeatedly while she is on the ground and Thor has to intervene to make her stop. I wish I could say I felt guilty for what I did. I don't. I still don't think this is a good way to train the army. That chapter was very short, chapter 15. It is visiting day. Before I forget, my editor, Vangelina Skov, she basically has to do the boring part that I hate putting the screenshots in. And then I get to add memes. It's the perfect system. It's literally the perfect crime. But she was editing the first part of this and she said that I can use this as a direct quote, or don't because why would you? But I'm emphasizing that this is important. This book is so awful, it is actually causing me physical pain. How do you think it feels for me, Vangelina Skov, to sit and script these and then have to read? How do you think it feels? And then I have to watch it again after you've done the first edit. How do you think it feels for me? I was recommended this book by a friend once and I never read it. Can't remember who that friend was, but they're prob that's probably because they're either a snake and a liar or an idiot. The plot is so empty that I don't even want to call it a fucking plot. The characters are literally as deep as a Gabby Hanna's poetry. And the entire premise of having a non-existent 2D lifeless world of which the only defining factor is that people are separated based on a single character trait that's not even well thought out, mind you, is lazy and dumb and I hate it so much. I'm so glad that she enjoys this content. Actually, I'm glad that someone backs me up. Sometimes when I'm doing these videos, I sort of, I lose a lot of focus and then I think, my God, is this even good content? Are people going to agree with me? Are people going to enjoy it? Am I right at all? So it's nice to have someone back me up. Because otherwise, you know, making a three hour long video and spending weeks in your life doing so, feels a bit redundant if no one's going to enjoy it, right? As well as that, the dialogue is so embarrassing that anytime someone tried to be snarky, I wanted to climb inside the floorboards to get away from it. She's been quite superfluous with the F-bombs, so I'm just editing it as I speak. You can guess where they were. It would be fine if this was written by a teenager who hasn't learned how life works or how human beings function, but it wasn't. It was written by an adult and they should be embarrassed. But honestly, I'm more embarrassed because this whole time I've been trying to write an actually good dystopian novel when I could have just had my cat walk across the keyboard, fill in the blanks with some lazy tropes, attempt at getting teenage readers exciting about picking which group they want to be in, and some forced, boring romance, and just call it a day. I'm angry and I hate this book and I want to nap now. So that is my editor, Evangelia Skov's review of <laughs> this book. Bit more succinct than mine, isn't it? What I'm doing in two and a half hours, she's done in five minutes. Let's continue, it's visiting day. Attention, he announces, flicking a lock of dark hair from his eyes. I want to give you some advice about today. If by some miracle your families do come to visit you, he scans our faces and smirks, which I doubt. It is best not to seem too attached. That will make it easier for you and easier for them. We also take the phrase faction before blood very seriously here. Attachment to your family suggests that you aren't entirely pleased with your faction, which would be shameful. Understand? This is basically a cult. I would know I've been in a few. They all use this little, oh, uh, your family don't like us. You should ditch your family and just hang out with us. I went in a serious one. Just check out my MLM video. I don't want new people to the channel to be like, oh my gosh, you grew up in a cult. No, no, no. 
I joined a sales cult because I was stupid and broke. Triss's mother has come to visit her. The last week and a half has been more affectionless than I realised. So she's been there for a week and a half and yet she's toned and all muscly, even though she's really not done much more than get it beaten up. Triss's father didn't want to come visit and her mother can't visit Caleb because the erudite have decided to be evil now or something. Four speaks to them. Triss's mum recognises him, so he gets moody. <laughs> of course he does. Unexplainable mood swings are sexy, guys. It's the number one trait to look for in a partner. They see her friends. An erudite girl is rude to Triss's mother, so Triss threatens to break her nose. This is the best thing that she's said so far. This is the character development that I want to see in all my protagonists. They leave to chat in private. Triss's mother asks Triss what her aptitude results were, and Triss says they were inconclusive. Is this because I'm a... I start to say, but she presses her hand to my mouth. Don't say that word. She hisses, ever. So Tori was right. Divergent is still a dangerous thing to be. I just don't know why, or even what it really means still. Why? She shakes her head. I can't say. I've read all the books, so I'll say it. Divergence just mean that Triss's super secret special power is that she is a normal person. She is a normal human being with a full range of emotions. Something something, genetically modified people, purity war, it's all a big experiment. Triss is what the world needs for the future apparently. And yet, if this is the case, then why are the outside experiment overseers letting the divergence be killed within the city? Doesn't make any sense, does it? Unless we assume at this point in the story that Veronica Roth didn't really know where the story was gonna go and that's why the third book doesn't line up with this one. If this is the case, I think publishers really need to stop pushing for authors to create series if the stories themselves do not require it. Stop trying to have the next Twilight, Hunger Games, Fifty Shades of Grey and the inevitable cash cow cash grab films. Let the stories be as long or as short as they want. They, they shouldn't be something that you can squeeze every drop of money and attention from the audience out of. It shouldn't work that way. <sighs> Mum tells Triss to go visit Caleb after initiation to research simulation serum. She leaves and tells Triss to eat cake. Triss realises that her mother was dauntless all along. Oh my God, I'm so shocked. This is shocking. What a shocking development. What a shocking twist. Chapter 16. In the dorm, Al has avoided speaking to his own parents because he didn't want to tell lies. I'd be in candor because I can't really lie. Case in point, this book is so boring. Al puts his arm around Triss and she leans away from him and then they act awkward and Triss leaves, but she does admit that it's nice to be liked. They're at dinner. You weren't allowed to have pets? Christina demands, smacking the table with her palm. Why not? Because they're illogical, Will says matter-of-factly. What is the point in providing food and shelter for an animal that just soils your furniture and makes your home smell bad and ultimately dies? Yeah, I can say the same for babies and children, except children cost way more and have tantrums, but I don't see the erudite being antenatalist, even though they probably should. They talk about the dog in the aptitude test and how they all killed the dog. I wouldn't do that. I'd have befriended the dog and let it eat the child. Anyway. Triss admits that she didn't get dauntless and says she got abnegation, but joined dauntless anyway. After dinner, we go back to the dormitory and it's hard for me not to sprint, knowing that the rankings will be up there when I get there. I want to get it over with. At the doors of the dormitory, Drew shoves me into the wall to get past me. My shoulder scrapes on the scro scrone. My shoulder scrapes on the stone, but I keep walking. I feel like this is a good example of why I find me, the bigger lazy easy, this writing boring. By the way, I've got Instagram now. My Instagram handle is big Elise Yeezy. All I'm redoing really on there is re-uploading my TikToks. And you can also find me on TikTok at real <laughs> easy, easy. This writing is very tell, don't show. Very matter of fact. My shoulder scrapes on the stone. So that should hurt, right? There's no description of this type of thing though. Even when she's in pain and screaming or whatnot, it just seems very dry. Four explains the rankings. It's boring and self-explanatory. So who cares? Mate, not me, thanks. Tris has ranked number six. Edward is number one. Molly, the girl that Triss beat, is ranked at number five and is mad about it. I'm getting so confused because I'm so sure that I've already read this out. I don't know what's going on. You, she says, focusing her narrowed eyes on me. You are going to pay for this. I expect her to lunge at me or worse, hit me, but she just turns on her heel and stalks out of the dormitory and that is worse. If she had exploded, her anger would have been spent quickly after a punch or two. Leaving means she wants to plan something. Leaving means I had to be on my guard. A lot of these dauntless initiates are just awful bullies. So how is it a good thing comprising your army of these types of people again? 
They aren't being taught to control their anger and they're allowed to pick on one another. It's just a bit dumb. It's nighttime and everyone is meant to be asleep but someone starts screaming. Everyone wakes up. Edward was stabbed in the eye. He gets taken to the nurse. As I reach for the door handle, Christina says, you know who did that, right? Yeah. Should we tell someone? You really think the Dauntless will do anything, I say, after they hung you over the chasm, after they made us beat each other unconscious? She doesn't say anything. It was clearly Peter who was jealous at being number two, ranked and not number one. And the Dauntless will refuse to do anything about an initiate stabbing another, even though technically it's incredibly cowardly to do so in the middle of the night when the stabby, the victim, is asleep. And these are the people who are making up the army with the intention of protecting the city and the public. Edward and his girlfriend Myra quit and they are doomed to a life of being factionless because a bully cowardly attacked him whilst asleep and no one's going to do anything about it. Maybe this would say something about corruption and leadership or local governance, except it goes directly against what Eric, one of the leaders of the Dauntless thinks. He hates cowardice. So much so that he was gonna hang one of them over the chasm to potentially die for seemingly being a coward. He should be throwing Peter into the chasm for doing this. Peter just cost Dauntless their best initiate. Hello? Anyone? Logic? Plot hole filler? Help? Chapter 17. Triss is moping around by herself so Dauntless born initiate Yuria tells her to come hang out with him for a while for an initiation ritual. Cult! Jonestown. One of the Dauntless knows four. Do you know him well? I asked. I am too curious. I always have been. Everyone knows four, she says. We were initiates together. I was bad at fighting, so he taught me every night after everyone was asleep. She scratches the back of her neck, her expression suddenly serious. Nice of him. She gets up and stands behind the members sitting in the doorway. In a second, her serious expression is gone, but I still feel rattled by what she said, half confused by the idea of four being nice and half wanting to punch her for no apparent reason. That sounds totally reasonable, babe. I grin at the sight of Yuria's dishevelled hair and the elevator door opens. We pile in, members in one and initiates in the other. A girl with a shaved head stomps on my toes on the way in and doesn't apologise. I grab my foot, wincing, and consider kicking her in the shins. Uria stares at his reflection. Who cares? Being a dauntless apparently means just being an arsehole because arseholery equals bravery. They go up an elevator a hundred floors and climb onto the roof to zip line 1,000 foot to the ground. That's ridiculous. Why do they have buildings that tall? Why does America have buildings that big? I went up in the Shard once. Wouldn't rate it. Wouldn't do it again. I went up twice, actually. Really didn't rate it. Wouldn't do it a third time. Mm. So far, being dauntless consists of punching each other with no real training behind it and a week and a half does not count. Getting tattoos, playing paintball, capture the flag, eating hamburgers and zip lining. This is not a real society. This is like children of the corn, but with more sacrifices. Triss enjoys the zip lining and the Dauntless accepts her, blah, blah, blah. But her friends get grumpy about this. I don't care. I'm getting such a massive deja vu. I don't understand what's going on. Chapter 18 is the second stage of initiation and they are now mixed with the Dauntless born initiates. So, says Lynn, scuffing the floor of her shoe. Which one of you is ranked first, huh? Her question is met with silence at first, then Peter clears his throat. Me, he says. Bet I could take you, she says it casually, turning the ring in her eyebrow of her fingertips. I'm second, but I bet any of us could take you, transfer. I almost laugh. If I was still abnegation, her comment would be rude and out of place. But among the dauntless, challenges like that seem common. I'm starting to expect them. Being dauntless is just being rude and arrogant. So you're first, Will says to Yuria. Yuria shrugs. Yeah, and? And you don't think it's a little unfair that you've spent your entire life getting ready for this and were expected to learn it all in a few weeks, Will says, his eyes narrowing. Yuria is just a product of the system. He is not the system itself. If you have an issue with that, then take it higher, not at some boy who was just born within the dauntless postcode through pure genetic lottery. For a former erudite, you're dumb. This is metaphorical for the class system in the UK and how nothing will ever change because they have us squabbling over irrelevant differences and placating us with Love Island to distract us from how class is the true divider amongst people and how we must put all of our arbitrary differences to one side to rise up against the elites, ruling classes, monarchy and oligarchy. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I think I just got possessed by the spirit of Russell Brand. Stage two of the initiation is some type of simulation set up similar to the aptitude test. This hallucinatory simulation will show people their fears and teach them how to control their emotions in frightening situations. 
4. Inject Triss. The serum will go into effect in 60 seconds. This simulation is different from the aptitude test, he says. In addition to containing the transmitter, the serum stimulates the amygdala, which is the part of the brain involved in processing negative emotions like fear and then induce a hallucination. I like to imagine they're just all getting injected with copious amounts of DMT. I will then forward the recording to Dauntless Administrators. You stay in the hallucination until you calm down. That is, lower your heart rate and control your breathing. I try to follow his words, but my thoughts are going haywire. I feel the trademark symptoms of fear. <sighs> Sweaty palms, racing heart, tightness in my chest, dry mouth, a lump in my throat, difficulty breathing. He plants his hands on either side of my head and leans over me. Be brave, Triss, he whispers. The first time is always the hardest. His eyes are the last thing I see. The way they are trying to get them to overcome fear is to throw them in the deep end with no breathing exercises or any advice to help them. That is not what training someone is. This is dumb. There's never any techniques actually being taught because it would require the author to think more about what she's writing. Triss hallucinates. A crow lands on her shoulder and then a flock of crows try to attack her so she screams and cries for help but no one helps her so she remembers she just needs to calm down. Breathe. I keep my mouth closed and suck air into my nose. It has been hours since I was alone in the field. It has been days. Show don't tell. Saying it has been days doesn't make us feel like it's been days when it's only been a page or so of action. Triss kind of gives up and she comes to from the hallucination. Why did you do that to me, I say? What was the point of that, huh? I wasn't aware that when I chose Dauntless I was signing up for weeks of torture. Did you think overcoming cowardice would be easy, he says calmly. Yeah, except they aren't actually being taught anything here except play fighting and playing games. So how do you expect people to learn anything? This system is terrible. Triss wants to go home, but that's not an option. Should be factionless. However, if abnegation are so selfless, then why wouldn't they accept people abdicating to them? That's not my problem. It's yours. <laughs> Learning how to think in the midst of fear, he says, is a lesson that everyone, even your stiff family, needs to learn. That's what we're trying to teach you. If you can't learn it, you'll need to get the hell out of here because we won't want you. I'm trying, my lower lip trembles, but I failed. I'm failing. No one is being taught anything. You could at least te teach them a few breathing techniques to calm down, but no. He sighs. How long do you think you spent in that hallucination, Triss? I don't know. I shake my head. A half hour? Three minutes, he replies. You got out three times faster than the other initiates. Whatever you are, you're not a failure. Three minutes? He smiles a little. Tomorrow you'll be better at this. You'll see. Of course, she's actually really good at this because she's very talented and special. The fears in the simulation are subjective metaphors because Triss isn't really scared of crows, else she'd be a nightmare to watch Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds with. What do the birds represent? Who knows? She's such a blank character, you can't really infer much from it. So I cheated and Googled what others thought. To be devoured by crows, symbolic of her family turning on her, powerlessness. As Trist notes when she's going through her fear landscape, the bird fear isn't about birds, it's about control. For example, there are lots of ways that a lack of control would appear to Triss. But it appears to her as a dangerous flock of crows. Why crows? This is just a theory, but it might have to do something with the fact that Triss symbolizes her family as birds, ravens, when she gets her first tattoo. And maybe the fact that it's a flock of crows instead of just one big crow has to do with her feelings about crowds, which she doesn't seem to love. The abnegation all blend together, but crowds of dauntless aren't always a great time unless they're working together as a community, like when she goes ziplining. The crow's blackness mirrors the black clothing worn by the dauntless, suggesting that the birds represent dauntless as a collective and hinting that the faction poses a threat to Triss's life. Here is my interpretation though. There are birds in this because the symbol of the third Hunger Games book is a bird. I solved the riddle. Triss and Four flirt. That's it, chapter 19. Peter is reading some erudite propaganda to everyone. Why else would the children of such an important man decide that the lifestyle he has set out for them is not an, is not an admirable one? Peter continues, Molly Atwood, a fellow dauntless transfer, suggests a disturbed and abusive upbringing might be to blame. I heard her talking in her sleep once, Molly says. She was telling her father to stop doing something. I don't know what it was, but it gave her nightmares. Read a skeeter and the audacity of this bitch. But I'm not done reading, he replies, laughter in his voice. His eyes scan the paper again. However, perhaps the answer lies not in a morally bereft man, but in the corrupted ideals of an entire faction. Perhaps the answer is that we have entrusted our city to a group of proselytizing 
proselytizing tyrants who do not know how to lead us out of poverty and into prosperity. Trusting one group to be the entire government isn't gonna work in any society. Triss is prevented from attacking Molly by Will and they all decide to Hakuna Matata and go get some tattoos. They come back and see Four. Four is drunk, he flirts with Triss. I can't help it. I smile. Will clears his throat, but I don't want to turn away from Four, even when he walks back to his friends. Then Al rushes, rushes at me like a rolling boulder, the, you know, the boulder from Crash Bandicoot, and throws me over his shoulder. I shriek, my face hot. Come on, little girl, Pff, he says. I'm taking you to dinner. Can I please have one young adult book where the man folk don't manhandle the women folk to assert dominance, please? Chapter 20. 20. Chapter 20, not 24. Skipping ahead. New simulation time. Triss is in a glass case of emotions. The box she's trapped in is filling with water, whilst the other initiates point at her and laugh. Triss breaks free of the glass and wakes from the hallucination. Four says she shouldn't have been able to crack the glass, thus she's divergent. Don't play stupid, he says. I suspected it last time, but this time it's obvious. You manipulated the simulation. You're divergent. I'll delete the footage, but unless you want to wind up dead at the bottom of the chasm, you'll figure out how to hide it during the simulations. Now, if you'll excuse me. But again, with the, you'll die if anyone else figures out you're divergent, but I will do nothing to tell you to hide it better or what it even means. Bye. These characters suck. It's nonsensical. Why can Divergence manipulate the simulation? I doubt there's an explanation for this. Everything in this book is shallow and rushed. If you know the explanation for this, then please write it in the comments below. Triss goes to visit Tori to try to glean some answers to the Divergent mystery. Among other things, you... You are someone who is aware, when they are in a simulation, that what they are experiencing is not real, she says. Someone who can then manipulate the simulation or even shut it down. And also, she leans forward and looks into my eyes. Someone who, because you are also dauntless, tends to die. A weight settles on my chest, like each sentence she speaks is piling there. Tension builds inside me until I can't stand to hold it in anymore. I have to cry, or scream, or... I let out a harsh little laugh that dies almost as it's born and say, so I'm going to die then. There is zero emotion in anything Triss actually feels. I have to cry or scream. And yet all of her text is emotionless. I have no idea why I wrote this next bit, but I'm gonna have to do it. I don't want to. <laughs> I just found myself going, no, I don't do that. Mein Gott. No, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do the accent and people will probably try and tell me off. I saw someone do the perfect Slavoj Žižek impression on TikTok, 10 out of 10. So with that in mind, all I write here was I write in like the accent of Slavoj Žižek. Mine got the ideology of the dauntless is a feti fetishization. I can't even say that word. How am I going to say it in an accent? Of the emotion, bravery and the death of parental figures having zero responsibility and so on and so on. It would have been good if I'd actually done it properly, but you'll just have to use your imagination. Not necessarily, she says. The dauntless leaders don't know about you yet. I deleted your aptitude results from the system immediately and manually logged your result. I can't even read this. Logged your result as abnegation, but make no respect. But make no but make no mistake, if they discover what you are, they will kill you. Makes zero sense of the third book, but okay. Tori thinks the Dauntless leaders killed her brother who was also divergent, but blamed it on suicide. Tori warns Triss to do better. Thanks for the advice, mate. Really good. Chapter 22. It has been four days, four whole days since the last chapter. Whoa, time skip alert. I wish this was vodka. Erudite keeps bitching about abnegation. Actually, I don't. Alcohol's bad for you. Stay sober. I reach the end of the tunnel. The net stretches across the gaping hole, just as it did when I last saw it. I climb the stairs to the wooden platform where Thor pulled me to solid ground and grabbed the bar that the net is attached to. I would not have been able to lift my body up with just my arms when I first got here, but now I do it almost without thinking and roll into the centre of the net. She's been with Dauntless for two weeks. How has she done pull-ups already? In the past four days, I faced four fears. In one, I was tied to a stake and Peter set a fire beneath my feet. In another, I was drowning again, this time in the middle of an ocean 
emotion as the water raged around me. In the third, I watched as my family slowly bled to death. And in the fourth, I was held at gunpoint and forced to shoot them. I know what fear is now. I know what boredom is now. Triss wonders if Four is divergent. Obviously, why else would he be looking out for her? The other initiates are cracking up from the simulations. As in they're stressed out, not they're cracking up with laughter. At, oh, I saw loads of spiders and I'm an arachnophobe. They're freaking out over them. There is a ranking of how well the initiates are doing. Triss is in first position. It takes her two minutes and 45 seconds to get out of the simulations. Peter shits himself in anger at Triss. He pulls me forward a few inches and then slams me against the wall. Again, I clench my head. You would think after all the hours I've spent doing this and before this, the clown worlds of reading out articles and stuff. You would think that I've gotten better at reading off of a screen. I could never be one of those TV presenters. I clench my teeth to keep from crying out through pain from the... Though pain from the impact went all the way down my spine, Will grabs Peter by his shirt collar and drags him away from me. Leave her alone, he says. Only a coward bullies a little girl. A little girl, scoffs Peter, throwing Will's hand off. Are you blind or just stupid? She's going to edge you out of the rankings now, dauntless, and you're going to get nothing, all because she knows how to manipulate people and you don't. So when you realise that she's out to ruin us all, you let me know. Ah yes, one person being in first position ruins everything for everyone else. This makes no sense. There's always got to be someone in first place. That's just how rankings work. Her being first place, like it's the top 10 that get to become dauntless right so her being being first place has almost almost like next to no effect on will be will can be in the other nine places she's just what look at me trying to do maths in my head somehow will falls for this and is suspicious that tris is being manipulative by acting weak and then acting tough somehow don't be an idiot will says christina hopping down from her bunk she looks at me without sympathy and adds she's not acting they're just sore that she went off of the divergent to zip line no the dauntless to zip line that that's what they're sore about usually in books like these there's moments of conflict and mistrust between friends to force the main character to grow and develop without relying on crutches it happens in harry potter the fourth book it happens in the third house of night you get the picture in this instance i think this situation is really forced tris wasn't pretending to be weak against peter to have will step in tris is physically a small girl and peter is a tall and strong boy he has a complete advantage over her with the added context that Triss grew up in abnegation where you weren't even allowed to run around, I'd say if you put her in a lineup of average fitness, average strength girls, she'd probably be on the lower end or like one of the weaker ones. I'd be well harder than her because I've been to the gym a few times. I bet she's never even heard of a gym. Two weeks of being in Dauntless and she's somehow gained muscles and pull-up strength, which is low-key bullshit. I've never had pull-up strength, but whatever. These two weeks of, even when I was like being well physically active like years ago and doing like boxing, had a little trainer and that kind of stuff like several times a week and I had m more muscle definition that I've got nothing going on right now. But I had actual like muscle definition in my arms and stuff. I still couldn't do a pull-up. So shut up. These two weeks have probably been the most physical activity Triss has ever had. So I think in this situation, Will saving Triss from getting beaten up by someone physically stronger isn't a good enough catalyst for him to then suddenly completely doubt her intentions. Anyway, Triss walks off by herself and Yuria finds her and invites her to watch him shoot a muffin off of someone's head. Proper army material, this lot. It's not a real gun, says Lynn quietly. It's got plastic pellets in it. The worst it'll do is sting her face, maybe give her a welt. What do you think we are, stupid? Yeah, or blind her, but whatever, stupid. By the way, I think teenagers doing dumb shit for kicks is definitely realistic. Me and some of my friends would sometimes take trolleys from a supermarket car park at night and then sit in them and crash into each other with them. But I just think it's daft that these lot are totally ungoverned by any real adults and then go on to form the army. How many times am I going to say that point? Four shows up with some others because he's just always showing up. Go away, do some work. What are you doing? You belong here, you know that, he says. You belong with us. It'll be over soon, so just hold on, okay? He scratches behind his ear and looks away like he's embarrassed by what he's said. I stare at him. I feel my heart beat everywhere, even in my toes. I feel like doing something bold, but I could just, just as easily walk away. I'm not sure which option is smarter or better. I'm not sure that I care. I'm not sure that I care either, mate. Join the club. I reach out and take his hand. His fingers slide between mine. I can't breathe. I stare up at him. He stares down at me. For a moment, we stay that way. 
Then I pull my hand away and run after Uria and Lynn and Marlene. Maybe now he thinks I'm stupid or strange. Maybe it was worth it. Maybe it's Maybelline. Tris goes to bed, but then gets up to have water in the middle of the night and conveniently eavesdrops on Eric talking to someone about divergence, but then Peter kidnaps her with Al and they hold her over the metal railing above the chasm. A heavy hand gropes along my chest. You sure you're 16 stiff? Doesn't feel like you're more than 12, the other boys laugh. Bile rises in my throat and I swallow the bitter taste. Wait, I think I found something, his hand squeezes me. I bite my tongue to keep from screaming, more laughter. Al's hand slips from my mouth. Stop that, he snaps. I recognise his low, distinct voice. When Al lets go of me, I thrash again and slip to the ground. This time I bite down as hard as I can on the first arm I find. I hear a scream and clench my jaw harder, tasting blood. Something hard strikes my face. White heat races through my head. It would have been pain if adrenaline wasn't coursing through me like acid. The boy wrenches his trapped arm away from me and throws me to the ground. I bang my elbow against the stone and bring my hands up to my head to remove the blindfold. A foot drives into my side, forcing the air from my lungs. I gasp and cough and claw at the back of my head. Someone grabs a handful of my hair and slams my head against something hard. A scream of pain bursts from my mouth and I feel dizzy. <sighs> Action packed, isn't it? Peter wraps a hand around my throat and lifts me up, his thumb wedged under my chin. His hair, which is usually shiny and smooth, is tousled and sticks to his forehead. His pale face is contorted and teeth are gritted, and he holds me over the chasm as spots appear on the edges of my vision. Crowding around his face, green and pink and blue, he says nothing. I try to kick him, but my legs are too short and my lungs scream for air. Four comes in to save the day and beats up the bullies. Chapter 22. Was this not chapter 22? Oh my God, I don't even know what chapter I'm on. Right, the previous one was 22. This is, no, the previous one was 21. This is 22. Tris wakes up with four in four's bedroom. That is such a fan fiction thing, I swear. When the hero saves the damsel in distress and then instead of taking them to a hospital, takes them back to... Their, their room or house to recover instead. Is it not? It isn't right to wish pain on other people just because they hurt me first. That must be the abnegation talking. It is by far the worst Hogwarts house. I could report this, he says. No, I reply. I don't want them to think I'm scared. Peter just tried to straight up murder Triss. And these are the people who will become the police and army and protectors of the city, for God's sake. Report him. Have it taken to someone higher up. Have him thrown out and be factionless. Like, pfft. she's just trying to be strong female lead. But it's not just about you, though, is it? What about all the other people? supposedly under their protection that he could then go on to whatever four tells tris to pretend to be vulnerable so her transfer initiate friends aren't jealous of her tris tells four that the assailants groped her but please when you see an opportunity he presses his hand to my cheek cold and strong and tilts my head up so i had to look at him his eyes glint they look almost predatory ruin them and how is she gonna do that by herself one against several including her former friend owl hmm. i swear all day I'm doing nothing but lazing around, life is good. As soon as I turn my camera on, all manner of distract distractions and destructions start coming at me. Chapter 23. Tris spends the night at fours and the next day he keeps touching her and she gets fl fl What's going on? I think I tried to roll my R's, but I forgot I can't do that. Thrilled, thrilled over it. He walks through the doors and I am alone. Yesterday he told me he thought I would have to pretend to be weak, but he was wrong. I am weak already. I brace myself against the wall and press my forehead to my hands. It's difficult to take deep breaths, so I take short, shallow ones. I can't let this happen. They attacked me to make me feel weak. I can pretend they succeeded to protect myself, but I can't let it become true. Weak, weak, weak. Does she ever go on about anything else? It's like Gabby from, what's it called? Attack on Titan, not American Psycho. Attack on Titan being like, kill, kill, kill all the time. Terrible series, don't watch or read her. Oh, never forgive Izayama for what he did. Tris joins her friends for breakfast and she tells them what happened. My eyes burn and it's not artifice, unlike the wincing. I shrug, it's not artifice. So what 16 year old talks like this? What you, it's not artifice. So who uses words like that? I shrug. I believe Tori's warning now. Peter, Drew and Al were ready to throw me into the chasm out of jealousy. What is so unbelievable about the Dauntless leaders committing murder? How is this a functioning society? There are zero consequences for Peter stabbing Edward's eye out. I don't even think there was an investigation. And there's not going to be any consequences for this attempted murder attack upon Triss's 
terrible insistence that she wants to take care of it herself well even if she did go to the authorities they wouldn't do anything about it if there's no consequences for attempted murder how are dauntless not killing every other faction already i'm aware that's basically sort of what happens at the end of the book but i doubt it would have taken that long for something like that to happen in the first place and they all had to get turned into mind control robots to carry out the deed Triss's friends decide to edge Peter's crew out of the rankings to get rid of them permanently. Four takes the transfers on a field trip. Four turns around and walks backward a few steps, backward on a narrow path with no railing. How well does he know this place? He eyes Drew, who trudges at the back of the group and says, pick up the pace, Drew. Oh yeah, context, he beat Drew up, like, so much that Drew had to go to hospital. It's a cruel joke, but it's hard for me to fight off a smile. That is, until Four's eyes shift to my arm around Will's and all the humour drains from them. His expression sends a chill through me. Is he jealous? Grow up, you're her teacher. We get closer and closer to the glass ceiling and for the first time in days, I see the sun. This cannot be good for their vitamin D. How are they gonna grow up strong now? They live underground like goblins. We walk across the glass, which is now a floor rather than a ceiling, through a cylindrical room with glass walls. The surrounding buildings are half collapsed and appear to be abandoned, which is probably why I never noticed the Dauntless compound. Why have these collapsed buildings not been cleaned up yet and the resources reallocated society collapsed due to an unknown war to us in book one but it got its shit back together enough to have several generations of these factions and this social experiment genetic experiment whatever they also have technology way more advanced than we currently do so why has a lot of the city not been cleared up it's like how bethesda thinks fallout should be rubble simulator good morning vault calling. The Dauntless mill around the glass room, talking in clusters. At the edge of the room, two Dauntless fight with sticks, laughing when one of them misses and hits only air. They're not doing anything useful with their time. Go outside and fix up those buildings. Maybe then the factionless would have somewhere to live. Four is showing them the fear landscape, which is a simulation that will test them at the end. Through your simulations, we have stored data about your worst fears. The fear landscape accesses that data and presents you with a series of virtual obstacles. Some of these obstacles will be fears you previously faced in your simulations. Some may be new fears. The difference is that you are aware in the fear landscape that it is a simulation. So you will, you will all have your wits about you as you go through it. This means that everyone will be like divergent in the fear landscape. Boo I told you before that the third stage of initiation focuses on mental preparation, he says. I wish, nope. I remember when he said that on the first day, right before he put a gun to Peter's head. I wish he had pulled the trigger. Yeah, same, would have made a lot shorter book. There's still a lack of emotion whenever Triss speaks, but I love this for her, iconic, really. We stan people who stand up for themselves. <clears throat> Bella Swan, <clears throat> I'm losing emotion reading this. That is because it requires you to control both your emotions and your body. To combine the physical abilities you learned in stage one with the emotional mastery you learned in stage two, what mastery? To keep a level head. How have they been learning to do anything? No one ever teaches them anything properly. Back at the dorm, Al wants to talk to Triss. Stay away from me, I say quietly. My body feels rigid and cold and I am not angry. I am not hurt. I am nothing. I say, my voice low, never come near me again. Our eyes meet. His are dark and glassy. I am nothing. If you do, I swear to God I will kill you, I say. You coward. Now that is character development. Chapter 24. Triss is dreaming and then she wakes up. Something is wrong with Al. Al has been found at the bottom of the chasm. He clearly did it himself. And I swear... I saw someone on Facebook, where else but Facebook, blame Triss for this, for not accepting his apology, right? You know, he only helped kidnap her, which had her be sexually assaulted and almost be murdered by Peter, right? He helped that little domino effect. And then he ran away like a child when four showed up. She didn't need to accept his apology. Him then choosing to do this, wasn't her responsibility. If anything, it is the responsibility of the Dauntless faction because Al was struggling badly, a lot of them were with the simulations, and this dumb cult puts recklessness above all else. It clearly isn't gonna have a good mental health service or support. If the non-divergents aren't lucid during simulations, I wouldn't be surprised if it caused psychosis in a bunch of them. I don't think causing mental illnesses is a good way to build up an army, but what do I know? 
they have a funeral and Tori comforts Chris. Tris, the bullies select like bullies. Tris punches Molly. In abnegation, no one has committed suicide in recent memory, but the faction's stance on it is clear. Suicide, to them, is an act of selfishness. We do not know why, says Eric, and it would be easy to mourn the loss of him tonight, but we did not choose a life of ease when we became dauntless. And the truth of it is, Eric smiles. If I didn't know him, I would think that smile is genuine, but I do know him. The truth is, Albert is now exploring an unknown, uncertain place. He leaped into vicious waters to get there. Who among us is brave enough to venture into that darkness without knowing what lies beyond it? Albert was not yet one of our members, but we can be assured that he was one of our bravest. So abnegation thinks that suicide is purely selfish. And here the Dauntless are saying, no, it's actually really, really brave. It's just two extremes. No one in the factions are allowed to have normal, nuanced, middle ground opinions. All the Dauntless chant for Albert the Courageous. Too little, too late, mates. Try supporting people whilst they're still alive next time, yeah? Triss runs off and bumps into four. Of course she does. She yells about stuff and then he warns her that Big Brother is watching you. My first instinct is to push you until you break just to see how hard I have to press, he says, his fingers squeezing at the word break. My body tenses at the edge in his voice, so I am coiled as tight as a spring and I forget to breathe. His dark eyes lifting to mine, he adds, but I resist it. Why? I swallow hard. Why is that your first instinct? Fear doesn't shut you down. It wakes you up. I've seen it. It's fascinating. He releases me but doesn't pull away, his hand grazing my jaw, my neck, my neck, my crack, my... <laughs> and my back sometimes i just want to see it again want to see you awake get you a man who pushes your buttons for his own entertainment but i should have i should have forgiven him maybe maybe there's more we all could have done he says but we just have to let the guilt remind us to do better next time i frown and pull back that is a lesson that members of abnegation learn guilt is a tool rather than a weapon against the self it is a line straight from one of my father's lectures at our weekly meetings what faction did you come from, Four? Four is blatantly from abnegation, but Triss doesn't realise it yet. Chapter 25. Triss has more tattoos. She's turning into Zoe Redbird. Triss and her friends are throwing away erudite reports into the chasm for a laugh, really, because no one cares about littering. The erudite representative is called Janine, and she is bad news. Christina and Will keep touching each other. This is some recap. Triss sees Four and decides to go talk to him. Why is he everywhere? It's not normal. There's never stuff about them bumping into the average dauntless people. It's always four around every corner. Triss follows four to the fear landscape room and he notices that she's tailing him. So he tells her to go into his landscape with him. The serum connects you to the program, he says, but the program determines whose landscape you go through. And right now it's set to put us through mine. That is some serious technology. So why have they not cleared up all of Chicago yet and made it all more livable, huh? They shoot each other up with serum and hold hands. His first fear is heights, so they jump off a building. Second is being confined in a tiny room, so they make themselves smaller and spoon each other. Third, he has to kill a woman, probably his mother, something, something, Freud. The fourth is Marcus, the bloke from Abnegation. Triss realises that Four is the errant son, Tobias, and Triss intercepts Marcus attacking Tobias by hitting Marcus back. They exit the simulation. If he does, he doesn't say so. He laces his fingers with mine. Come on, he says, I have something else to show you. Yeah, I bet he does. Chapter 26. All I want is some salt and chili tofu, man. They talk about the aptitude test. Four lies, clearly, and says he got abnegation. He left regardless to get away from his father. Tobias admits that he fancies Triss. I'm not trying to be self-deprecating, I say. I just don't get it. I'm younger. I'm not pretty. I... He laughs, a deep laugh that sounds like it came from deep inside him. Say deep one more time. And touches his lip to my temple. His lips to my temple. Don't pretend. I say breathily. Oh, don't pretend. I say breathily. <laughs> I'm going to get banned. You know I'm not. I'm not ugly. But I am certainly not pretty. Fine. You're not pretty. So, he kisses my cheek. I like how you look. Swoon, what a heart throb. Get you a man that calls you butters to your face. They kiss. For a few minutes we kiss, deep in the chasm, with the roar of water all around us. And when we rise, hand in hand, I realise that if we had both chosen differently, we might have ended up doing the same thing in a safer place, in grey clothes, instead of black ones. I quite liked this one single paragraph out of the entire book. Monkeys and Shakespeare and all of that. Chapter 27. These chapters are so short. Breakfast the next day, Triss is excited about Tobias. 
Then he walks in. His hair is shorter and it looks darker this way, almost black. It's abnegation short, I realize. I smile at him and lift my hands away from over, but he sits down next to Zeke, Zeki, without even glancing in my direction. So I let my hand drop. I stare at my toast. It is easy not to smile now. Well, I suppose it is inappropriate for a teacher to be snogging a student, or would Dauntless simply find this brave and commend him for it? Who knows? Lauren, the instructor of the Dauntless Born Initiate, stands with her hands on her hips outside the fear landscape room. Two years ago, she says, I was afraid of spiders, suffocation, walls that inch slowly inward and trap you between them, getting thrown out the dauntless, uncontrollable bleeding, getting run over by a train, my father's death, public humiliation, and kidnapping by men without faces. That's pretty much all of the fears there are. I used to think that walls that close in on you, like a booby trap in a poo- in a what? In a pyramid or a tomb, not a poom, what's a poom? Would be absolutely a bigger problem than it actually is. That and quicksand and lava. I have been misled. The instructor will have each initiate face one of their fears. Triss gets assigned kidnapping. This gives her flashbacks to actually being kidnapped from, you know, three days ago and she freaks out. So Tobias has a go at her. Get yourself together. This is pathetic. Something within me snaps. My tears stop. Heat races through my body, driving the weakness out of me. And I smack him so hard my knuckles burn with the impact. He stares at me, one side of his face bright with flushed blood. And I stare back. Shut up, I say. I yank my arm from his grasp and walk out the room. Such an icon. Bella Swan could never. The chapter has ended. There are so many chapters in this book because they're all about five pages long. Chapter 28. I hear the train horn. The train tracks loop around the dauntless compound and then continue farther than I can see. Where do they begin? Where do they end? What is the world like beyond them? I walk toward them. How have more people within the factions not wanted to see what is beyond Chicago? The erudite love knowledge. So why aren't all of them traveling beyond the city limits to see what's up? How are they getting resources and stuff as well? How are they being that self-sufficient, not going beyond the city? But I don't know. Triss decides to randomly go see Caleb. The faction members are milling around everywhere. Erudite faction norms dictate that a faction member must wear at least one blue article of clothing at a time because blue causes the body to release calming chemicals and a calm mind is a clear mind. That is why the Facebook logo is blue as well to keep you on the site. It's not a joke, it's just a fact. Triss waltzes into the main erudite building and threatens an employee, but luckily Caleb is just randomly there. Something big is happening, Beatrice. Something is wrong. His eyes are wide and glassy. I don't know what it is, but people keep rushing around, talking quietly, and Janine gives speeches about how corrupt abnegation is all the time, almost every day. And then, instead of focusing on the important matter at hand, they just start bickering. Don't you think I would know if I was being manipulated? If they're as smart as you think, then no, I don't think you would know. You have no idea what you're talking about, he says, shaking his head. Triss leaves, but two erudite men take her somewhere. I wish I had a gun. These are dauntless thoughts. Those are just American thoughts. <laughs> Triss is taken to Janine, who quizzes her about choosing Dauntless. What does this have to do with anything? I try to soften my voice, but it doesn't work. Aren't you going to reprimand me for abandoning my faction and seeking out my brother? Faction before blood, right? I pause. Come to think of it, why am I in your office in the first place? Aren't you supposed to be important or something? Got him. Triss lies about abnegation sucking to throw Janine off from working out she's divergent. Can I take that to mean, Janine purses her lips and pauses for a few seconds before finishing, that you agree with the reports that have been released about the political leaders of this city? The reports that label my family as corrupt, power-hungry, moralizing dictators? The reports that carry subtle threats and hints at revolution? They make me sick to my stomach. Knowing that she is the one who released them makes me want to strangle her. I smile. Wholeheartedly, I say the erudite to drive her home. I don't know what they'll do to me when I get back. I suspect it will be bad. I imagine my feet dangling over the chasm and I bite my lip. When the driver pulls up to the glass building above the dauntless compound, Eric is waiting for me by the door. He takes my arm and leads me into the building without thanking the driver. Eric's fingers squeeze so hard I know I'll have bruises. Eric starts threatening Triss, but Tobias walks in because of course he does. He's everywhere. He's like Edward Cullen but with less personality. They lie to Eric that Triss tried to kiss Tobias and he rejected her, so she ran off. Somehow Eric buys this, reprimands them both and leaves. Why do you care anyway, I say. My throat is hurting from like talking so much. Uh, I'm massaging my vocal cords. ASMR, self-massage vocal cords. Uh, 
Uh, it's like I've been possessed. Why do you care anyway, I say. You can either be cruel instructor or concerned boyfriend. I tense up at the word boyfriend. I didn't mean to use it so flippantly, but it's too late now. You can't play both parts at the same time. I am not cruel, he scowls at me. I was protecting you this morning. How do you think Peter and his idiot friends would have reacted if they discovered that you and I were... <sighs> he sighs. You would never win. They would always call your ranking a result of my favouritism rather than your skill. You could have told her that this was your plan so she didn't feel like you were being hot and cold with her, you pathetic Edward Cullen. Which, may I add, is impressive because Edward Cullen is already a pathetic Edward Cullen. Somehow this guy is worse. They decide to be boyfriend and girlfriend now. At the dorm, Christina tells Tris that she and Will kissed. They discuss the factions. I don't think I could have made it through the candor initiation though. She shakes her head. There, instead of simulations, you get lie detector tests. All day, every day. And the final test? She wrinkles her nose. They give you this stuff they call truth serum and sit you in front of everyone and ask you a load of really personal questions. The theory is that if you spill all of your secrets, you'll have no desire to lie about anything ever again. Like the worst about you is already in the open. So why not just be honest? Cult, 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 cult. This is something that the Bullingdon boys would do to each other. Tress meets Tobias at night time and they snog on the train. Two things you should know about me. The first is that I am deeply suspicious of people in general, he says. It is my nature to expect the worst of them. And the second is that I am unexpectedly good with computers. A few weeks ago, before training started, I was at work and I found a way into the Dauntless Secure Files. Apparently we are not as skilled as the erudite are at security, he says. And what I discovered was what looked like war plans. Thinly veiled commands, supply lists, maps, things like that. And those files were sent by Erudite. Snore. Tell someone who gives a crap. Tris realises Erudite will use Dauntless to fight for them somehow. Chapter 29. I have attended Abnegation's initiation ceremony every year except this one. It is a quiet affair. The initiates, who spend 30 days performing community service before they can become full members, sit side by side on a bench. One of the older members reads the Abnegation Manifesto, which is a short paragraph about forgetting the self and the dangers of self-involvement. Then all the older members wash the initiate's feet. Then they all share a meal, each person serving food to the person on his left. Hippies. Dauntless celebrate by getting drunk and falling off of stuff. The dormitory, at least, is quiet. I stare at my plate of food. I just grabbed what looked good to me at the time. And now that I take a closer look, I realise that I chose a plain chicken breast, a scoop of peas and a piece of brown bread. Abnegation food white people food i bet tris thinks mayonnaise is spicy <laughs> look at me all billy big balls just because i found out that i'm 21 percent pakistani <laughs> white people am i right <laughs> i'm kidding bloody white people they head towards the initiation trial hey tris yuria calls out from across the room he sits with the other dauntless born initiates only four of them are left the rest have gone through their fear landscapes already he pats his leg you can sit on my lap if you want does he fancy her too? Because for someone who isn't pretty, all the guys sure do like her. It's Triss's turn. Chapter 30. Triss's fear landscape goes like so. Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. So Triss materialises a gun to scare the birds away. Then the tank, which Trish shatters after some initial difficulty. And then the sea attacks her. So anyway, Triss beats the ocean. Then she's tied to a stake to be burned like a Salem witch, so Zoe Redbird calls forth the elemental affinity of water to extinguish herself. Triss is back in her bedroom, in abnegation, and a man is standing outside of her window, staring at her. For a moment, the room is silent, and then the fists pound against my window, not just two or four or six, but dozens of fists with dozens of fingers, slamming into the glass. The noise vibrates in my ribcage, it is so loud. Then the scarred man and his two companions begin to walk with slow, careful movements towards me. One of my fears, this would appear in my fear landscape, is looking outside of windows at night time, just in case aliens are outside staring back at me. Same as this really, isn't it? Trish shoots the faceless men. I don't have enough bullets in my gun. Pale bodies, human bodies, but mangled, arms bent at odd angles, two wide mouths with needle teeth, empty eye sockets, topple into my bedroom, one after the other, and scramble to their feet, scramble towards me. I wonder what this looked like in the film. Guess I'll never know. Triss calms enough to enter the next simulation, which is Tobias wanting to bang. Tobias, more like to bang us. He presses his mouth to mine and my lips part. The external da Dauntless are watching her, not her fears, but just her within the, the room, right? So they're gonna watch her make out with thin air. 
She laughs at Tobias and breaks the simulation into the next one, which is Janine telling her to kill her family, but Triss has her shoot her instead. Chapter 31. Triss completes the evaluation and she and the others get injected with tracking devices in case she or they go missing. Which is a load of rubbish. How did everyone go along with that? If you tried to do that in this country, there'd be an uproar. You joke him. The small crowd files out of the room, but Tobias lingers. He pauses by the door and beckons for me to follow him, so I do. The glass room above the pit is full of dauntless, some of them walking the ropes above our heads, some talking and laughing in groups. He smiles at me. He must not have been watching. I heard a rumour that you had only seven obstacles to face, he said. Practically unheard of. Ah oh, yes, Triss is special because she has less fears than other people. You, you weren't watching the simulation? Only on the screens. The dauntless leaders are the only ones who see the whole thing he says. They seemed impressed. The Dauntless leaders had to see Simulation 4 tried to have sex with Triss. That is a bit mortifying, to be honest. That is worse than the Candor initiation. People notice me after a few seconds. I stay close to Tobias's side as they point, but I can't walk fast enough to avoid some cheers, some claps on the shoulder, some congratulations. As I look at the people around me, I realise how strange they would look to my father and brother and how normal they seem to me, despite all the metal rings in their faces and the tattoos on their arms and throats and chest. I smile back at them. It just sounds like being in the world's end in Camden. Triss and Four go back to his room and they kiss, but Triss feels apprehensive. What? What's wrong? I shake my head. Don't tell me it's nothing. His voice is cold. He grabs my arm. Hey, look at me. What a dreamboat. What's in it for me? He repeats. He steps back, shaking his head. You're an idiot, Triss. I'm not an idiot, I say, which is why I know it's a little weird that of all the girls you could have chosen, you choose me. So if you're looking for just, um, you know, that... What? Sex? He scowls at me. You know, if that was all I wanted, you probably wouldn't be the first person I'd go to. All they do throughout this trilogy is misinterpret each other and then argue about it. I feel like he just punched me in the stomach. Of course I'm not the first person he'll go to. Not the first, not the prettiest, not desirable. I press my hands to my abdomen and look away, fighting off tears. I am not the crying type, nor am I the yelling type. I blink a few times, lower my hands and stare up at him. I'm going to leave now, I say quietly, and I turn towards the door. No, Triss. He grabs my ha wrist and wrenches me back. I push him away hard, but he grabs my other wrist, holding our crossed arms between us. Mmm, manhandling. Love it. Triss is worried that Four must be experienced because he is so much older than her. He is literally just two years older than her, but okay. He admits it's all new for him too, so the two virgins kiss and make up. Four also has a tattoo of abnegation on his back, as well as the other factions. I think we've made a mistake, he says softly. We've all started to put down the virtues of the other factions in the process of bolstering our own. I don't want to do that. I want to be brave and selfless and smart and kind and honest, he clears his throat. I continually struggle with kindness. We kiss again, and this time it feels familiar. I know exactly how we fit together. His arm around my waist, his hands on my chest. Wait. His arm around my waist, my hands on his chest, the pressure of his lips on mine. We have each other memorised. They've been kissing for all of a day. Get real. Chapter 32. They go to the hall for the banquet. Triss sees her mates. What job are you going to pick? I ask her. I'm thinking I might want a job like Fours. Training initiates, she says. Yeah, that's an easy job. Good choice. She should be doing sweet fuck all. Question, says Christina, leaning forward. The leaders who are watching your fear landscape, they were laughing about something. Mortifying. We aren't big on speeches here. Eloquence is for the erudite, he says. The crowd laughs. I wonder if they know that he was an erudite once, that under all the pretense of dauntless recklessness and even brutality, he is more like erudite than anything else. If they did, I doubt they would laugh at him. I wondered when Triss knew for a fact that Eric was erudite born and not just something she theorized. So I Googled him and this bloke came up for the film, which is absolutely not what I was picturing. I kept picturing a young Snape with piercings. So maybe this guy was putting Dauntless on purpose. They always had this plan, the erudite to, you know, do what they do at the end of the book. Triss ranks first place because of course she does. Her friends pass. Molly and Drew get cut out and become factionless, get wrecked. Triss kisses Tobias and works out what's going on. One, coloured serum contains transmitters. Two, transmitters connect the mind to a simulation program. Three, erudite developed the simu... Erud... Three, erudite... Three, erudite developed the si Three, erudite developed the serum. Four, Eric and Max are working with the erudite. How was Triss the only person to work out what's going on? Chapter 33. There's 72 pages left and this is where the bulk of the plot is going to crash into the story. I call this 
the twilight technique. I tried to get Tobias alone after the rankings are announced, but the crowd of initiates and members is too thick and the force of their congratulations pulls him away from me. I decide to sneak out of the dormitory after everyone else is asleep and find him, but the fear landscape exhausted me more than I realized, so soon enough I drift off too. This was her first mistake. Triss wakes up to everyone silently getting changed. Christina ignores Triss when prompted, all of them do. Triss then mimics them and follows them to a cavern full of guns. Of course, Eric said every Dauntless was injected yesterday, so now the entire faction is brain dead, obedient and trained to kill perfect soldiers. I think they'd be below average soldiers seeing as all they've learned to do is just hit each other. They all enter the train and Triss finds Tobias who silently holds her hand because he's divergent too, duh. They enter abnegation territory. Far ahead of us, I see a dauntless soldier push a grey cloth man to his knees. I recognise the man. He is a council member. The soldier takes her gun out of her holster and with sightless eyes, fires a bullet into the back of the council member's skull. The soldier has a grey streak in her hair. It's Tori. My steps almost falter. I thought that she was divergent. I'm not convinced that she's not. I think she's just really committed to the act like a method actor. She's like Jared Leto. The main character's hometown getting destroyed to help resolve her to her cause is also something that happens at the end of The Hunger Games, Catching Fire, happens to Erican's home, Eragon's hometown, it happens to Hobbiton. It's a trope. Well, I thought, oh, it must be a trope. So I looked it up and it actually is. It's called Doom to Hometown. I am so good. This mind, don't, you know, fuck with this mind. Eric comes over to taunt the seemingly lifeless Triss and Four, and then Eric threatens to shoot Four, so Trish shoots Eric's foot. They run, Triss gets shot in the soul. They run, Trish. They run, Triss gets shot in the soul. Shoulder. They get surrounded by soldiers and called out for being divergent. Chapter 34. Oh my God, this is so difficult. They are both taken to Abnegation headquarters to see Janine. You, Tobias, or should I call you Four, managed to elude me, she says quietly. Everything about you checked out. Test results, initiations, simulations, everything. But here you are nonetheless. She folds her hands and sets her chin on top of them. Perhaps you could explain to me how that is. You're the genius, she says coolly. Why don't you tell me? Her mouth curls into a smile. My theory is that you really do belong in abnegation, that your divergence is weaker. The amount of absolute zingers in this book, mate. How do any of these characters recover? If Tobias's comments bother Janine, she doesn't let on. She keeps smiling and stands smoothly. She wears a blue dress that hugs her body from shoulder to knee, revealing a layer of pudge around her middle. Oh my God, what a bitch. We know Janine's plan, so I don't need to recap it to you. Yes, improved, Janine says. Improved and working toward a world in which people will live in wealth, comfort and prosperity. At whose expense, I ask, my voice thick and sluggish. All that wealth doesn't come from nowhere. Currently, the factionless are a drain on our resources, Janine replies, as is abnegation. Maybe if you went beyond the limits of Chicago, you'd find more resources. Maybe, maybe you'd find something. As is abnegation. I'm sure that once the remains of your old faction are absorbed into the Dauntless army, Candle will cooperate and we will finally be able to get on with things. Oh look, the big intellectuals hate the homeless. Wait a second. What is the message here? Selfless metaphor for Christianity faction, good. Intellectual scientists, bad. Wait a minute. I have a sneaking suspicion about something. Let me do some Googling. Her maternal grandparents were concentration camp survivors whose religious convictions pushed their mother away from joining religion. Roth learned about Christianity by attending a Christian Bible study during her high school years and has stayed with it. Why do I always end up reading religious propaganda? Leviticus 19.28 Amplified says... Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print or tattoo any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Maybe Roth should have done more Bible studies then. Innocent people, Janine laughs. I find that a little funny coming from you. I would expect Marcus's son to understand that not all of these people are innocent. She perches on the edge of her desk, her skirt pulling away from her knees, which are crossed with stretch marks. What is going on? Bad lady has normal body. Ha ha. What? I can control what you hear and see, she says. So I created a new serum that will adjust your surroundings to manipulate your will. Those who refuse to accept our leadership must be closely monitored. Monitored or robbed of free will. She has a gift with words. You'll be the first test subject to bias. Beatrice, however, she smiles. You are too injured to be much use to me. So your execution will occur at the conclusion of this meeting. 
It's nice, isn't it? Tobias kisses Triss and strangles Janine, but he gets stopped by soldiers. Janine infects Tobias with a new serum and Tobias starts strangling Triss, but they stop him and send him off to the control room. Triss gets sent off for execution and is knocked out. Chapter 35. Triss wakes up in a tank that starts to fill with water. This is an incredibly theatrical execution. Did they just happen to have a tank lying around that coincided with one of Triss's fears in the abnegation headquarters, no less? What a load of rubbish. If they were that serious about executing her, they would have just shot her in the head immediately. The video camera means they're watching me. No, studying me, as only the erudite would, to see if my reaction in reality matches my reaction in the simulation, to prove that I'm a coward. What an extreme length to go to to prove something that doesn't really matter ultimately. I breathe in. The water will wash my wounds clean. I breathe out. My mother submerged me in water when I was a baby to give me to God. It has been a long time since I thought about God, but I think about him now. What God? Which one? Did Christianity survive the purity wars? Why haven't we seen any churches or praying places? Why is the first time that I've heard of this? Triss accepts the drowning, so she sits and waits for it to happen, but luckily her mother smashes her out of the tank. She wears a sleeveless shirt. When she lifts her arm, I see the corner of a tattoo under her armpit. No wonder she never changed clothes in front of me. Mum, I say, my voice strained. You were dauntless. So I started thinking about how the outside world planted the mum called Natalie into Dauntless without anyone knowing. She was 16, but they changed her age to 15 officially, fine, whatever. She already had tattoos from being in the outside world. Okay, whatever. They had to memory wipe Dauntless members so no one would go, um, who is this complete stranger? So they have the tech for all of these serums and memory wiping and all of this. Why are they doing this giant city experiment to find genetically pure humans? Clearly the experiment isn't going well if the non-pures are systematically hunting and killing the pures. Just, it's just nonsense. They run away together. I don't understand why we're such a threat to the leaders. Every faction conditions its members to think and act a certain way, and most people do it. For most people, it's not hard to learn to find a pattern of thought that works and stay that way. She touches my uninjured arm and smiles. But our minds move in a dozen different directions. We can't be confined to one way of thinking and that terrifies our leaders. It means we can't be controlled. And it means no matter what they do, we will always cause trouble for them. Congrats, you're a normal person. Actually, that's not true, is it? It's not true. A lot of people act the way that the non-divergence way, the non-divergence do. They think of one way of being and then just stick with it. Is this saying something about our society? Who knows? Triss's mother sacrifices herself so Triss can get to safety. Chapter 36. Three soldiers are chasing Triss so she shoots blindly at them. Just one set of footsteps now. I hold the gun out with both hands and stand at the end of the alley pointing at the dauntless soldier. My fingers squeeze the trigger but not hard enough to fire. The man running toward me is not a man. He is a boy. A shaggy haired boy with a crease between his eyebrows. Will. Dull eyed and mindless but still Will. He ru stops running and mirrors me, his feet planted in his gun up. In an instant, I see his finger poised over the trigger and hear the bullet slide into the chamber, and I fire. I s my eyes squeeze shut, can't breathe. The bullet hit him in the head. I know, because that's where I aimed it. That is actually some conflict, and I liked that, but I'm sick. I press my forehead to the wall and scream. After a few seconds, I clamp my hand over my mouth to muffle the sound and scream again, a scream that turns into a sob. The gun clatters to the ground. I see Will. He smiles in my memory, a curled lip, straight teeth, light in his eyes, laughing, teasing, more alive in memory than I am in reality. It was him or me. I chose me, but I feel dead too. This is decent. I like it. It took 500 pages. Triss finds the safe house with Caleb and some other abnegation, including her father. I did what you said, what mum said. I researched the simulation serum and found out that Janine was working to develop long range transmitters for the serum so a signal can reach further, which led me to information about Erudite and Dauntless. Anyway, I dropped out of initiation when I figured out what was happening. I would have warned you, but it was too late, he says. I'm factionless now. Doesn't he rejoin them in the second one? Pathetic. Triss's father cuts the bullet from Triss's shoulder. It's hard saying Triss and then Triss's and then Triss's shoulder. It's hard, all right? And he stitches her up. She tells her family that the mum is dead. He helps me to my feet. Time to face the rest of the room. My mother told me to save them. Because of that and because I am dauntless, it is my duty to lead now. I have no idea how to bear that burden. She's 16. What on earth is she going to do? She tells them that the erudite are using mind control and then she decides that they should wake the soldiers up from the simulation. There is 30 pages left of this book. I feel like this is an action sequence that should take longer than this. Triss works out that the simulation has been controlled by da from Dauntless headquarters. 
It's, it's a guess and it's a pretty lucky guess at that. I faintly registered that I said them. As of yesterday, I technically became dauntless, but I don't feel like one and I am not abnegation either. I guess I am what I've always been. Not dauntless, not abnegation, not factionless. Divergent. Yeah, we get it. You're divergent. What is this incessant need with labels anyway? Back in my day, we would say catchy things like, don't label me, labels are for soup cans. That is what we'd put on our MySpace pages. <laughs> but now everyone needs this strict label to know exactly where they stand in this universe of chaos, but it's fruitless because we must always be in a state of flux to adapt and survive. Tribalism bad, chaos good. Chapter 37. Caleb and Triss's father go with her, including Marcus, who insisted despite my protests, like, like that's not gonna cause conflict later on. I assume you now regret choosing Dauntless, Marcus says. He's already just trying to force drama. Like literally, what is the point of this? She is risking her life to save Abnegation and the other factions. And he's just being snipey and snide. Like what twat, just push him off the train. Push him off the train. They go on the train to Dauntless territory and jump off. I sit down, breathing hard and look across the rooftop. Caleb and my father stand at the edge of the roof, their hands around Marcus's arms. He didn't make it, but he hasn't fallen yet. Somewhere inside me, a vicious voice chants, fool, 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 fool. Anyway, someone shoots at them. So Trish goes to ambush, Trish, not Trish, not Trisha Paytas, goes to ambush them, but it's Peter. She successfully ambushes him, the Dauntless leaders. They evaluated my records and removed me from the simulation, he says. Why? Why? There is no need for, I don't believe that. I reckon he's divergent. Why would they do that? It'd be easier to control him if he was mind controlled. Whatever. Triss shoots him in the arm. Why is it always Trish follows, followed by a word of an S? SH at that. It's difficult. It's hard for me to say that. I don't know why. Trish, Triss shoots him in the arm to show she's not messing around. So Peter says he will tell her info if she saves him. My father takes off his long sleeve shirt. He weighs a... <clears throat> oh, no. My father takes off his long sleeve shirt. He wears a gray t-shirt beneath it. He crouches next to Peter and loops the fabric around his arm, tying it tightly. As he presses the fabric to the blood running down Peter's arm, he looks up at me and says, was it really necessary to shoot him? Yes, in this instance, I would say it's necessary. What makes you think that you have the right to shoot someone, my father says. Shut up, this guy is dangerous, he is bad news. Set your ethics and morals aside for a moment. You're in a life and death scenario. This is like that Bible thumper. <laughs> Is that offensive? It's like the it's like the the, the Bible people in Ram. You know the ones who go to uh, different countries to spread the message of Christ. The one in Rambo Four who is like when Rambo kills the pirates who are about to murder them and take the girl off for you know even worse stuff. The Bible thumper who's like Rambo, how dare you kill those pirates who were gonna kill all of us? What gives you the right? What gives you the right to do that? And then by the end of the film, he's so traumatized by the stuff that he's seen and experienced. And it's like, it's mayhem and chaos. Have you seen Rambo? Oh, that's a great film. By the end of the film, he is bashing some dude's head in with a rock. The father is exactly like that. Realize what I say without turning around. That every second I waste means another abnegation dead and another dauntless made into a murderer. I've realized that. Now it's your turn. There is a right way to do things. What makes you so sure you know what it is, I say. Seriously, bro, your people are getting mass murdered right now and you won't argue over the ethics of shooting someone in the arm. Get a life. There are men with guns up there. When they see me, they will kill me if they can. I tell my father quietly. I search his eyes. Should I let them? He stares at me for a few seconds. Go, he says, and God help you. Soz, but the dude is aware that his people are getting shot like fish in a barrel. I think that's an expression. So I don't really think it's realistic for him to pipe up about ethics during a life and death scenario right now. Those talks are for the after. The book was probably attempting to make some point about morality, yet like everything else this book does, it is incredibly shallow and not very thought out. Somehow, Triss, a 16 year old who has been using guns for less than a month, takes out some guards. One is divergent and he doesn't fight though, he just walks off. I hand one gun to Caleb and slide the other one under my belt. I think you and Marcus should stay here with him, I say, jerking my head towards Peter. He'll just slow us down, make sure no one comes after us. 
I hope he doesn't understand what I'm doing, keeping him here so he stays safe, even though he would gladly give his life for this. If I go up into the building, I probably won't come back down. The best I can hope for is to destroy the simulation before someone kills me. When did I decide on the suicide mission? Why wasn't it more difficult? By the way, this whole trilogy becomes Trish trying to get herself killed for no actual real reason. Two guards come out of an elevator, so Trish's father shoots them. What was that about ethics now, huh? What a cheaply quick turnaround. Trish's dad gets shot and killed, RIP. It has more emotional impact if your character doesn't spend their last few moments being annoying, by the way. Trish breaks into the control room and confronts Tobias, chapter 38. Tobias is still within his own simulation and threatens to shoot Triss, so they grapple until Triss gains the upper hand. Tobias, please, I'm begging, I'm pathetic, tears make my face hot. Please, see me. I don't know, this is a pretty reasonable response, mate. Like, it's not pathetic. You don't want to kill him. Stop being such a Bella Swan about it. Instead of shooting a mind-controlled Tobias who is dead set on killing her, she gives him the gun. I guess screw abnegation after all. Chapter 39. Tobias doesn't kill her because he is an independent divergent who don't need no simulation. Through the power of love and divergence, Tobias wakes from the simulation so they have a cheeky snog. Guys, people are dying. Can it, can it wait for two minutes? Monitoring the CCTV, Tobias stops the mind-controlled Dauntless from killing Caleb. Tobias copy-pastes the simulation data into a hard drive and stops it. They leave. Triss sees her father's body and froze up. For a second I feel like everything inside me is breaking and I crouch by a body, breathing through my mouth so I don't smell the blood. I clamp my hand over my mouth to contain a sob. Five more seconds. Five seconds of weakness and then I get up. One, two, three, four, five. Ah yes, having a emotional reaction to seeing your father's dead body is weakness. Carry on. Caleb and Triss reunite. Marcus walks up to Tobias and wraps his arms around his son. Tobias stays frozen, his arms at his side and his face blank. I watch his Adam's apple bob up and down and his eyes lift to the ceiling. Son, sighs Marcus. Tobias winces. Hey, I say, pulling away from Caleb. I remember the belt stinging on my wrist and Tobias' fear landscape and slip into the space between them, pushing Marcus back. Hey, get away from him. At the very least, I'll give her this. Triss is not as passive as Bella, who probably would have stood there wincing, chagrinning, and thinking about how this would affect her. They all head towards the Amity compound. You nearly died today, he said. I almost shot you. Why didn't you shoot me, Triss? I couldn't do that, I say. It would have been like shooting myself. Nose boy for one month. I might be in love with you, he smiles a little. I'm waiting until I'm sure to tell you though. Dates girl for three days. Abnegation and Dauntless are both broken, their members scattered. We are like the factionless now. I do not know what life will be like separated from a faction. It feels disengaged, like a leaf divided from the tree that gives it sustenance. We are creatures of loss. We have left everything behind. I have no home, no path, and no certainty. I am no longer Triss, the selfless, or Triss, the brave. I suppose that now I must become more than either. Lovely. Acknowledgements. Thank you, God, for your son and for blessing me beyond comprehension. <laughs> yeah, cheers, <laughs> cheers, God. Thanks for doing nothing about poverty or war or the cost of living crisis or anything, but thank you for helping me write my cash grab. <laughs> the moral of this story is God works in mysterious ways. Mysterious, profiteering, cash grabby ways. And that is the end of this video. I hope that you, why am I dying now? Oh my God, it's God. Literally, it's probably smiting me, Jesus. I did it again, I can't help myself. I'm not even, I'm not a Christian. How is it so ingrained within me to say Jesus and oh my God, don't matter. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you remember to like, comment, subscribe. Thank you so much to Casino World for sponsoring today's video. Remember, no real money, just pretend like Monopoly money. Remember to check out my second, my podcast channel, my third channel where I upload shorter videos and TikToks, my TikTok account and my Instagram. I think that's all the promo that I need to be doing for myself. See you guys next time. If you enjoyed this, I'll do the second one. Cheers. Bye.